You're listening to the Getting Salty Experience Podcast. And we are back. Welcome back, Leatherhead Nation, to the Getting Salty Experience Podcast, the only podcast that brings the firehouse kitchen table to you. And you might ask, what is the kitchen table? The kitchen table? Pfft. It's where some of the greatest minds in the world come together to figure out the world's biggest problems. The he kitchen lying. table. The kitchen table. Welcome back to the self-proclaimed best firefighting <laughs> podcast <laughs> in the whole world. Oh, yeah. that's a uh, trademark way. self-proclaimed best podcast <laughs> in the world. Ricky Bobby we'll Inc. <laughs> Ricky Bobby Inc. Woo! Thank you. Okay, first you last. Woo. Yes, we are back. Hey, Phil, Ruffy, I'm feeling better, finally. I, I'll God. tell you one thing, man. I've been watching some stuff. We, we up here, we got about eight inches of rain, but we didn't have any of the flooding that was going on in Oof. the city. My goodness gracious, man. Did you see the cross Bronx? Dude, yeah, it's a beautiful. I, cannot, view. I saw I saw firemen walking almost up to chest high to get people out of cars. Yep. And, uh, I mean, it was that's what they call it flash flooding. Holy <laughs> mackerel. No, I mean, it was like Coops, Queens Boulevard. It, the subway where you walk down from the sidewalk was full to the top of water. Yeah, man. It was full, filled up. You ain't lying. Yeah, man. It was very bad. I, I'm not going to say. I mean, I thought about the guys out there and I said to myself, Is that when you turned over with your blanket? Oh, like, thank oh, man. God oh. I'm not out there in that oh, shit. Oh, I'm not out there. <laughs> Holy <laughs> Christmas. I was a little thought in there. I yeah. said, Oh, boy. Oh, boy. My boy, that goodness. sucks for somebody. I remember those days, man. I'm not. I they had not like 15, 15 people in Queens died, drowned. 20, 27 total deaths, I believe. Wow, um, I and, know. Joke, yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, he responded, uh, PD had to go to a, a collapse of a house and they, they were in the, um, the basement apartment, uh, mm. the two in there and he couldn't get them out. And that was that, you know, so it's, it's, uh, well, your, your, uh, your, other your other one, your other one, your other friend. Your other friend. <laughs> Pick it up. Come on. <laughs> Thanks, Ruffy. We, we just had a, you know, we just had a little bit of a realization that there's, we have two of the exact same sound bites on the board. Hold on. This is one. Come on, man. Same guy. <laughs> same guy. How did we not know well, you that last you week? You cannot take credit for that. Our guest no, tonight. Our, our guest, guest yeah. pointed that out. Uh, we got a good guest tonight, man. Oh. I, read his, I read his resume, bro. And this Woo! might be one of the most impressive. It's hot. It's hot. It's very hot. Ouch. Ouch. Caliente. But it's don't hot. forget, we have to do our shameless plugs before we get to this uh, amazing oh, guest. Oh, okay. Pete, have at it. Okay, well, sure. If you guys watched us this long, you guys know that the way to support us and support the channel is to go to GettingSaltyApparel.com to get you, yourself, or your friends or family a cool tumbler like this as an example. Or maybe a nice hat like the one Ruffy's wearing or the Bronx Bend t-shirt that Mr. Kevin is wearing there. GettingSaltyApparel.com, guys. That's where you will find... All the coolest firefighter apparel and accessories in the game. I don't have to tell you twice if you've seen the show, but if you if it's your first time, head on over there. Give us a little love. You'll love the stuff, I guarantee. My favorite is the Zippo with the little fire blowing out the third floor. Very, very cool. Um, and uh, come to a uh, firefighter show near near you. I guess Wildwood's our next one, Kev, right, where they can see us Wildwood, live? Wildwood, yeah, they'll see us. They won't see Ruffy. He's in uh, my head. But they will see us in Philly at the Inner Ships. Very nice. Pummel too, man. Well, Philly? Mm. Oh, my God. They got crushed. Well, yeah, good. we're not there now. Thank God. So Yeah, man. Oh, well, man. anyway, guys, gettingsaltyapparel.com. Thank you for all the support. And also, guys, <clears throat> if you want to support us tonight while you're watching, you absolutely positively have to have a question asked because there's a fire in your goddamn pants. Mm -hmm. Make sure you <laughs> hit us up in the Super Chat, right? The Super Chat is where you guys uh, will find uh, – we'll, That's we'll how you sell that. Definitely That's get your – yeah, you got fire in your pants. You hit us in the super chat, or if you just want to shake us off a little, you know, you know, if you do a little. Hey, Moose, Rocco, help the judge help find his checkbook, will you? Yeah, don't make me have to come help oh. you find your checkbook. You know what I mean? All right, super chat us, guys. We love that. Thank you. That's a huge super support. Chat. Really appreciate you guys on that. And all right, I think it's time for our esteemed guest. Yes. All right, so listen, I've gotten. Probably more DMs. Is that what they call them? DMs? Right? DMs, oh. bro. They're sliding up in your DMs. Dude, I had more people talking about this next guest than you can shake a stick at. So let's get him on the show here. He's a lifelong 
fire service guy starting way back in the 70s. Without further ado, let's bring in our guest, Pete. Chief Bob Hoff. There he is. There he is. He's repping too. Nice shirt. He ain't scared to rep it. And you know what else? He actually paid for that. We didn't send that to him. Wow. <laughs> Holy mackerel. I really I thought I liked this guy, but now I really like him. Support Welcome, the Chief. Cause. Support the cause. Welcome, Chief. Welcome. Thanks Welcome for having me. Show. Yeah, we, we we like to get those uh, Midwest guys on there. We consider Chicago Midwest, right? Of course, Midwest. Yeah. We like the Midwest guys. You guys talk funny, <laughs> like Don Hayter when he came out here to teach. He didn't talk funny. We listen funny. <laughs> hey, he's got it. He's got it. Well, you know, right. before Kev, before we dive into his we have to, team career because I am back in the cups tonight. I am mm. over the COVID back in the cups. Although my wife's, I told him not to. This is my mother. I told him not to drink. He it's just gonna, got over the COVID. He it's going to weaken it. his immune, immune system. system. Right. Da -da. So <laughs> you're back on it. Let's give us our uh, word of the day, Petey. All right, guys. Today's word of the day, brought to you by GettingSaltyApparel.com, is Jago. <laughs> 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 you could thank uh, Chief Timothy for that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jagoff. Jagoff. All right, so let's get right into it, Chief. I mean, you were doing this since you were a kid, right? Bring us in where you grew up, how you got into the fire uh, service, uh, how you got bit by the bug, the whole nine yards. Bring us way, way back, way back. Bring us way back. Um, third generation. My grandfather retired as a captain. Uh that was my first set of gear in 1967. Um, I had a uh, silver tinsel Christmas tree, too. Yeah, that was my mom's favorite with the little wheel that turned around. <laughs> That's right. It had the colored wheel, right? Kubi was mm -hmm. just saying in that yeah. picture, you could see uh, that's your father, right, in the back there, and then you have that picture behind you now. It's yeah, that's a painting of my dad. Yep. Amazing. Amazing. So there's your first outfit in 67. Your grandfather was on and your dad as well, third generation. Yes, uh, my son's fourth generation, but uh, yeah, I, I uh, uh, my father was killed in the line of duty when I was five years old, and that that's what uh, oh my God. drove me into the f fire service for that's, sure. Well, yeah, man, that's a young age. Do you remember? I mean, your father was a chief at the time, though, right? When when he, my father was a battalion chief, and he had just been assigned. He was uh, taken out of the field. He was in the eighth battalion, and he was assigned to the fire academy as the assistant director of training. They called him a drill master. And uh, he was only there six months, and he responded on extra alarm fires. And uh, the day he got killed was Valentine's Day, 1962. Oh, and uh, I don't remember what I did yesterday, but I remember everything that happened on that day. Really? You remember where you were, what you were doing at the time? I was home from school with the measles. Oh, wow. Oh, oh, man. My mother's oh. ass. I was right, so you were, now, you're the youngest of three, uh, three brothers, is that correct? Uh, the youngest is six. Oh, Five. shit. Well, one girl. Where'd the other ones come from? We didn't talk about them. They, got, they, got they were busy. Them My parents were busy. They were, they're watching much TV. <laughs> I'm one of seven, so I know the deal. I know it. There you are with your dad, right? Uh, that was my first uniform inspection at Soldier's Field at the age of uh, four. Um, something about this picture that's, again, you want to throw humor and stuff. That's 1960. My father was in the Navy, and he, uh, he spit-shined his shoes, and I bought my shoes to him that night. And he spit shine mine also. And my mother dressed me in my little silly outfit. And if you look at the pants, they're kind of long. Well, it wasn't because they were long. It's because my mother didn't put a belt on me. But after you fix it, they can, I dropped trowel. Not on purpose. So, Flash it, got the nickname Droopy Draws. From <laughs> my word. All right, so let's get back to you. Your, your dad's a, a battalion chief at the time. Do you, do you have any memories of going to the firehouse? I mean, you were five. That's pretty young. But do you have any memories of going to the firehouse with him? Just to pick up his check. Uh, at that time, he had to go to, uh, I remember when he was a Captain Engine 64 on Laughlin, and uh, he would take me to go get his check. Uh, but that's basically all right. I remember. Of, uh, how, many, how many years did he have uh, on the job at the time? He was, when he got killed, he was 44 years old, and he had 17 years. Wow. So he was promoted. He was a chief at a fairly young age, man, 17 years on the job. He, he, he rose a lot of quick, too. Yes, he did. Right. So do you want to walk us through that job at this point? Uh, you know, we want to kick sure. off that. Sure. Go ahead. Sure. 
Um, like I said, it was Valentine's Day, 1962. I was home sick that day from school with the measles, and I remember my dad had a driver. Uh, and they did response duty every other week, and it wasn't his week to respond to fires. But anyway, when he got his breakfast, he had a bowl of bananas and milk, no cereal, just bananas and milk. And his driver came, blew the horn. My dad gave me a crack on the ass and a kiss on the forehead and said, finish my, my bananas and milk. I did, and I've never eaten it since. Uh, but he went off to work that day and was just me and my mom at home. And uh, my mom got a phone call about, I don't know, 1030 or so. It's saying, uh, was my aunt asking if it's Tom at that big fire. My dad's name was Tom. And uh, my mom says, no, he's not due to respond this week. Well, the next thing we know that there's a car pulling up. It was my uncle Howie was on squad eight. The commissioner, he was at the fire. The commissioner told him to get in the car and go get my mom. Uh, my mom answered the door and she looked at me and she went out on a porch, left me in the house and she knew exactly what had happened. Uh, this building that my father and the other chief were killed in was a three story brick veneer building. It had 15 code violations against it, but it was still occupied and was tied up in court. It was uh, heavy timber uh, construction in the basement, uh, uh, timber beams. And the fire started in the boiler in the basement, got up in the plumbing walls and up into the cock loft. This is the actual picture, right, Chief? This, this, is, is, the the front, job. this is the front of the building. Uh, guys are on the third floor. They were on the second and third floor with hand lines, uh, making an aggressive interior attack. Um, it went to a 411 alarm. Uh, the commissioner, the fire commissioner at that time, Bob Quinn, was on the scene. And he asked my father and the other chief. There were no portable radios at that time. But he asked my father and the other chief to go in and get those guys out. It's time to, time to go. There's a crack in the sidewall. So my dad, uh, that's the commissioner there. My dad took the third floor uh, and he, he yelled in on the second floor to come on back the lines out. He went to the third. He yelled in twice. Hey, let's go, guys. Time to go. Building's not looking good. And the guys inside, one of them said, give me five, give us five more minutes. And uh, my dad said, no, now. And uh, my dad ended up going in and tapping him on the shoulder and said, time to go. And this firefighter, the lieutenant, they tapped on the shoulder. They were on the hose line. And uh, he said, let's go now. And it was one of my dad's firemen when he was a lieutenant. Anyway, they exit the building. And as they're exiting the building, my dad's the last one out. He's in the kitchen. And in that area where you see the white wall, there's the back door going to the porches. The porches stayed up. But uh, the other chief went straight down and was wedged under the uh, back porch doorway. And my dad and the other firefighter who was a driver for the chief were plummeted into the collapse. Um, uh, they, they, my dad's driver rolled out onto the back porch and walked away with bruises and, and uh, scrapes, uh, Ed Stack. But uh, uh, it took 20. This is this is firefighter Conley, who uh, who was uh, the other chief's driver, and he was talking to my father for 45 minutes, and then the building shifted, and that's the last he heard from my father. So when they got Conley out and they dug uh, Chief O'Brien out. It was wedged under the back door. He was he was deceased. Conley was trying to tell the chiefs where they thought where he thought the voice was coming from. Um, the guys did a great effort to try to go in and get my father, but the walls were starting to, to fall in, and they had to call a crane out. Um, something that I don't think my mother will, you know, God rest her soul, but I don't I, I don't know how she sat there and watched them take this building apart, pour water in it, knowing that her husband was inside. Uh, that's something we don't ever want to do is take somebody's yeah. spouse or their family to a scene when you're digging a body out. But uh, it was five hours, and uh, they got the wall section down, and they, they dug my father out. And uh, she got home about 7 o'clock at night to give us the news. That, Did they uh, ever say what your dad was talking to him about, were they, were, you know, what their conversation was for that 30 minutes? Uh, no, he said he, said he was – he kindly remembers saying that there was a refrigerator or something next to or on top of my dad. He wasn't quite sure, but he knew because he, he was in the kitchen area, which would make sense. But uh, he said the building didn't shift that much, but it was enough. He was in a, in a void, kindly. Uh -huh. And he said the building shifted enough, and he called out Tom, Tom, and he never got an answer. Oh. So, huh. Why, now, um, why did why did your dad respond that day if he was off? Did they ever say what? Uh, th thank you. I forgot to tell you that. There was the, the head of training was in a meeting and my dad loved going to fires and my dad said, you stay in a meeting. I'll take it in for you. Oh, wow. Holy shit. So, yeah. And, uh, 
you know, to go back to, to the, the lieutenant that was up on the top floor that was on that hose line, it's given to give us five more minutes. 30 years later, he retired as a deputy district chief. And uh, as we do in the fire service, the next morning, we took, took him out for a roll call to a local bar. And uh, we were there about an hour and he said, come here, I got to talk to you. And uh, we went in the back corner of the table and he told me, he said, he told me the whole story. Just like I just told you, he said, I was a guy on the line with my company and your dad had to come and grab me by the fire coat and say, let's go. That had to be eating that guy up all of this time, For right? 30 years. And he was one of the toughest firemen, one of the best bosses we had on the job. And I, he said, I, I was a cause of your dad's death. I said, no, you weren't. The building was, you weren't. And he lived with that. So, you know, in our, in our job, and you guys know better than anybody, that's when you're, you know, in my career, I put nine firemen in body bags and you, that never leaves you. No. You deal with it, it humbles you every which way it can. Just as my father's death, every one of us in that family dealt with it a different way. And I'm going to use some language here. Did, did it fuck us up mentally, every one of us? It sure did. Mm. But I, I can tell you personally what it did for me. It humbled me. I watched, uh, and I when I think of you guys, New York, 343 firefighters on 9-11, and I think of the spouses. And like me and my brother used to talk. My one brother and me were the only ones that were on the job out of the family. And uh, we would say we'd rather have a father than a dead hero. But out of that... Out of his death came an angel, and that was my mother. And we don't—I don't think we talk enough about the spouses, what they do for, you know. My mother, my brother was 23, my other brother was 20, going to be 21, and she finished raising us. She put us through Catholic schools. Look what it did to me. It didn't do any good. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but they—they're the—they're heroes too. They are truly by far heroes and angels. How how old were the kids? When your dad passed away, obviously you were five. How how old was the oldest? Like, was my uh, angel. Um, yeah, it's in that one picture. My my sister was ten. My oldest brother Tommy, who uh, moved to Texas, and he he didn't become a firefighter, but he was uh, he was one of my my mentors because he was a, he was a workaholic. He was a tough dude. Uh, my brother Ray was twenty or twenty one. Michael was fourteen. My brother Eddie was twelve. My sister was ten, and I was five. Wow. Tell us about this news clipping right here and the significance of it, uh, Chief, if you don't mind. Well, the first picture on the right is uh, my mother, and that's my Uncle Howie who was assigned to Squad 8. You know, he was tasked to, given the task to go pick my mom up. Uh, Uncle Howie and my dad were, were good buddies, besides being related. Um, so that's her getting to the scene. The picture on the left is my oldest brother, Tommy. He worked for Braniff Airlines at the time, and he got to the scene – and uh, he was there the whole time. They put my mom in a car off to the side, and he was outside watching him take that building part. And if you look at him holding, they found my dad's helmet. He was holding my dad's helmet, and that's the picture they used in the movie Backdraft. Only they reversed it where the younger son was the one outside the building holding the helmet. Right. Jeez. Now, but, I, I got a lot of guys that said that they this the Backdraft was actually inspired from your dad's story. Is that the uh, – Yeah, it was, your... was uh, just a sidebar on that. Um, it was, and it was also a uh, family out of California. I didn't really know that story, but we were, myself and my brother were, were interviewed by Ron Howard. Mm -hmm. I was interviewed by two hours, for two hours by Robert De Niro, who played the part of the, the arson investigator. And actually the burns on his back in the movie were pictures of the burns on my back. I, obviously they were exaggerated in the movie, but they took pictures of my back to use them on De Niro's back for the movie. But we were asked by Ronnie Howard if we wanted to be any part of the movie, and we both declined because it was too close to home. Wow. Hmm. Um, do we want to show those pictures now, Chief, with the burns, or do we want to get into that story later? We can get into that story later, I think, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All so right. let, let me ask you, Chief, what, you know, I mean, do you have memories of the funeral and stuff like that, the line of duty funeral? Is that any you know, stuck in your head at all? Or I, I – I was in a car at the funeral. They didn't bring me because I was still kind of sick. Um, but I, I do remember Mass as a fireman. It was at 83rd National at Sheehy Funeral Home. I remember that. Um, but after that, I don't. And did, did it at all, you know, maybe inhibit you from wanting to become a fireman or did it, did it stoke the flames even more for you to want to become a fireman? How did it affect you? I wanted to be him. Really? Wow. I wanted to be him. So um, yeah. 
Chief, that's funny you say that because my old man passed away when I was nine. And I, I mean, I think I've said this on this podcast at some point. I mean, everything I do to this day, 50, I'm going to be 53. To this day, I still think that that guy's watching over me and I'm doing everything that I can to make him proud and to walk, you know, as close in that man's shoes as I can. And you know, Lou, you said something really important that, that, that I think my brother and myself that were on the fire department lived this way. And I, I think the rest of my family did, but we, we had, believe me, I didn't do everything right in my life, but I, and on the fire service, I tried to do everything to make him proud. No doubt about and it. I know my brother did that too. Um, and you know, taking a six pack and a lawn chair and going to the cemetery, sitting at their graves. So there's something to be said for that. Um, but yeah, you want to make them proud and still at 65 years old, I want to make yeah, them still, proud. Right? That's crazy. Yeah. Well, looking at this right here, your timeline, I think you did a damn good job of that. <laughs> so, you did a, da a damn good job of that, sir. <laughs> I just want to let everybody in the audience know that we, we do a big pre-show that starts usually around 7 o'clock, and we run our guests through the, the whole thing. And Kev gets to the timeline, and about 20 minutes later, I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah. What did you say? It was like you sounded like it was like uh, coming out of a dictionary what did you say yeah i said oh and we we finished the whole entire webster's dictionary by the time we got through <laughs> the end of the uh timeline there it was incredible no, unbelievable yeah. unbelievable so um where do you guys want to go from here i want to go with uh how you first started buffing out at the firehouse you said 15 truck you started uh well you My guys was, uh engine 45 truck 15 at that time were on the east side and they were they were the busiest in the city the guys on the west side had contend that they weren't but that area where engine 45 and truck 15 were had had 10 high-rise project buildings and they had low rises so they were busier because of the project buildings but that that was that was like your warriors that was they were going to fires they were doing sometimes four or five so what, what year are we talking about here that you started buffalo uh, the first uh that's when i was in probably uh eighth grade but i started my first mattress fire my brother took me to was in 1967. uh you know he had me down on the stairs he said just stay here we'll be you know, I got to smell my first smoke at at at, uh, at age so, eleven. So, so your so your brother was on already, right? He, he came out in 1965. 1965. Okay, and so, he was a tremendous fireman. And uh, where where was he stationed? Was he, he wasn't was he a 45 and 15 or somewhere else? He was assigned to Squad Eight because oh. that's where he was a fan. Right. Squad Eight went out of service. They reorganized the squads. They put the squad that squad out of service. So he went to Engine 45, and then he transferred over to Truck 15 because they were the busiest. That's oh, where he so, was going to be. So that's why you picked that fire. And there he is in the middle uh, uh, with the with the, the Elvis, uh, Elvis Bear 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 That's my brother. <laughs> Looks like the Eddie Woof Woof there, uh, the Munster <laughs> yeah. guy. That, yeah, that perfect yeah, my, DA. My brother lost his <laughs> cab. Uh, he married my sister. Oh, wow. Look at that. Staying in the family. Firefighters he, in the family. my brother, and he ended up meeting my sister and marrying her. He was a cradle robber. I think he's 10 years older than her. Oh How boy! Dare he. Have to do it. <laughs> How rude! Nice. Everyone, everyone in that. I threw this picture. Uh, I gave this picture to you because everyone in that picture, you know, it was a black and white firehouse. And I look at some of the things that go on in today's world. Those men, and they're obviously, I, I profess women in the fire service, but those men in that day—that's all there were. They were, they were tough men. They got along. Uh, you like take a look at the mix of the guys in here. One was tougher than the other. They were in that firehouse because they wanted to be busy. They didn't make a lot of money then. Um, yeah. They all worked side jobs to support their families. They were tough men. Those are the people, when you say I, I had a good career, I had a good career because of people like them. Right. Um, there's some people that stand out that, that besides my brother and brother-in-laws and, and cousins, my, my uncle Howie McKee, his, his sons were on a job and they were, they were all tremendous firemen. Uh, and I learned a lot from them too. But these guys were the guys that, that where I cut my teeth. And and they didn't give a shit what color you were. They really didn't. It just no, uh, that, that's what's sad to me today. It doesn't yeah. matter. Is yeah. you know, it's I, I learned how to swing an axe down there from those guys. I learned how to open roofs. I learned how to throw ladders uh, and quickly. You right. know, I I look at guys now when they drop down, and, I, and I'm not knocking the fire service, but our aggressiveness in some spots is is missing. I look at guys now and I got to drop down on their knees to put their face piece and hood on. Are you shitting me? I want to be the first one in the door. <laughs> Head that shit on before you get to the building. Throw the face piece on in the doorway. Get in. I look at it. It's like 
if you do it in training, you're going to do it at a fire. That blows my mind. Yeah. But those guys, I mean, that there's a lieutenant that I rode with. His name is Pat Healy. Um, there's a picture of him in there. Um, me and him standing next to truck 15, but he was the guy and that was a four man truck. And sometimes I'd be the fourth guy as a fan down there. He'd have a, he'd have us throw a 38, two section or a 30, 30 foot, two section to the second or third floor before the line was charged because ladders were for firefighters and before masks, if there were people in the windows, you got them down the ladders, but the ladders for, were for us. That's what he right. taught me. Aggressive, fast, quick, get in. Why we threw the ladders. He was in doing the searches by himself. That's how I learned it. Yeah. And I'm talking, I mean, you got on in this in the seventies too. So uh, they weren't using masks back then, evidently. Right. Correct. No, we had them on a snorkel squad, but we didn't use them. Right. Uh, and then we, you know, we went to, uh, we went to the sport model. We had, uh, the MSA, we had a, a configuration for a sport model, and then we had one for <laughs> I love that, the sports model. I, I, I squad two, I burned. We had five. It was lean. It was day. really, it was a lean and aerodynamic. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, now we got two of them from him tonight, bro. We got, this, is, this is the right here. Yeah, you could burn your eyes real good, and I did once, and uh, you do what you do. You go back to work the next day and shake it off. Right. Ooh, All right. So yeah, you guys call it fans. Some guys call it buffs. Some guys call what's the other word? Uh, whackers, right? So you guys call it fans, right? If you're riding, your yes, fan. we've been called whackers too. Yes. Oh, there. All right. So okay. So uh, it's universal. So uh, in '72, you become a cadet with the Evergreen Park Fire Department. And what's yeah, that? So I'll throw a quick story out there because he can't get in trouble for it now. But my mom passed away when I before I went into high school. And we lived, we moved out of the city and moved in a, uh, Evergreen Park. So my long story, my brother got hurt in Vietnam and my sister and my brother-in-law were taking care of him when my mom passed away. And my brother says, I'll take the young idiot. So I moved in with my brother. He got on the Evergreen Park Fire Department as a, as a volunteer. Um, and I got on as a cadet. We lived in Evergreen Park. He couldn't, he wasn't supposed to live outside the city. He eventually got turned in and had to move in, but I was out of high school by then. So, uh, but, but that's where I, you know, and, and it, it, you talk about New York, Chicago, uh, Milwaukee, Boston, big departments with tough, tough people and tough chiefs. Uh, the chief of Evergreen Park at that time was a guy named John DeRoos, an old wooden shoe. And the guy that was under him was a, a guy named John Hojack, one of the finest people and toughest men I've ever learned anything from. So they're out there. They're all over, not just from big cities. And I had to yeah. say it because that guy taught me a lot, too. I never heard that term before, old wooden shoe. <laughs> We're so learning so much from this guy tonight, bro. This might be our most informative guest ever. I'm trying to be nice, too. I swear a lot. Hey, bring that. Bring that shit. We love it. <laughs> you don't care. You got yeah. me started, Chief. Yeah. Awesome. All yeah. right, so uh, 72, you're a cadet with them. 76, you get hired by the, by the city of Chicago to become an EMT to work on a BLS ambulance. So that yes, was they, first. they had a, uh, uh, a grant funded program from the federal government where they put, I think it was nine or 10 extra ambulances in the city and we were BLS and I was fortunate enough to get, get on um, nine months before I got hired for the job. But I, I actually asked to go to the firehouse where my father was, the squad was gone, but the ambulance was in the house at engine 61. And I was assigned to that ambulance, ambulance 36 until I was able to cross over as a firefighter. Wow, that's cool. Uh, any of those? Yeah, we had axes and poles in the. Me and my partner had axes and poles in the ambulance, so just in case. Caught a, caught a, well, we, they, you know, the fire alarm office. We take as many ambulance runs, but yeah. when a fire came in, they would leave us alone so we could go to work. Yeah, nice. I, I, I can tell you what wasn't at that place was a bunch of jagoffs. Hey! No. Hey! <laughs> Cheers, boys. No jack off there, that's for sure. Oh, start. Don't start with the double. <laughs> so you're not there long. You get, uh, did that time count to your time in service? Uh, it you? counted as my time on the job, yes. Oh, beautiful. So 76, 77, you get hired to be an actual firefighter in Chicago, correct? Yes, we were in the academy for five months. Um, we were the first group off a new list. And um, I, had, I had called the captain of Truck 15 where I was a fan. And, and I said, if there's anything you could do for me to to try to get me this truck 15, I, uh, you know, I won't let you down. And uh, he was working it. And one day we're in the drill yard throwing. We had bangers at the time. They were wooden. So my buddy 
who was in my group, Charlie Hatter, he was a, he was a football player, big black guy, strong as an ox. Me and him were on the, on the tormentors or the beams when we're throwing a, the banger. So the commissioner's supposed to come down. Well, his aide comes first to make sure every, there's no cigarette butts on the ground and all the bullshit, you know, we're going to make it look good for the commissioner. Well, he comes in, he goes, uh, Hey punk, where, where, where do you think you're going? I said, I don't know, sir. I said, uh, I'd give my, I give my left nut to go to snorkel squad one, which was the, the busiest squad in the city. It was the only snorkel squad. They went citywide on extra alarms. And he goes, uh, we're only taking, I told him I give my left nut. He said, we're only taking right nuts. <laughs> I said, okay, all right, no big deal. So when the order came out, I was assigned to snorkel squad one. Oh, shit. And, and it was a, what a company. Um, that's a picture on North Avenue. We, uh, when you pull up and there's nothing showing. Now we, we talked about this before. So the, the, the squads are basically the rescues, right? Same thing as our rescue squads. Yes. Uh two piece unit. Two that rescue, was a 55 right. foot snorkel with a rescue rig that followed it. Now the rescue rig goes first and the snorkel goes behind. So they would take, they took a guy right out of the Academy and sent them there. Myself and a guy named Terry Smith, who was a green beret went there on that order. Yes. Uh, very, you know, like I said, did I get did I get spots because of who I was? I'm sure I did. Well, I was just going to ask you that, Chief. Did you feel like when you went into the into the academy, you know, sure, I mean, people were watching you, right? I mean, a little bit more than the average uh, Joe Schmo that was coming into the academy. I was I was prepped. I was told to keep my mouth shut, which <laughs> I did. Um, you know, I, I learned a lot before I went in there, but I learned more when I went in there. But I kept my mouth shut. I wasn't an asshole. Um, but yeah, you know what things. People help you along the way, but I don't think I didn't want to let anybody down and help me, and I and hopefully I didn't. But yeah, I was lucky to get that company, no, and I learned great. so much. So. Well, listen, that happens even you know with the FDNY. You know the guys. Again, you might not know some of the guys who've lost uh, fathers on the job, right? Because they do the right thing, right? Stay low, keep your mouth shut. The things will work out. You know, guys will try and take care of you, right? If you do the right thing. Right. And, and and that has happened for 20 years. I mean, just just for the World Trade Center, you know, uh, legacy guys, right. but, you know, other guys as well, obviously. Right. So, you know, what we got to ask him, right, Roof? You get this. You get to squad one. How long you before, when you walk in the door before you go to your first job? Uh, well, our first job, we had a three. We ran with three pieces there. I don't want to get into a crazy story, but we had a third rig. It was a uh, chemical rig. It was on a Chevy chassis, and this guy donated it to Chicago Fire Department, and the commissioner put it in a house where it didn't go anywhere. And the guy said, hey, are you ever going to use it? It had uh, 2,000 pounds of 4 powder in it. And he said, give it to SS1. Let him run the wheels off it. So the first run we get, and my he ended up being a commissioner uh, at Altman. He was my first lieutenant. First run we get is on the overpass on the expressway. It's a 20-yard dumpster of magnesium on fire. So the first two engine, what do you think they do? They lead out and they put water on it, and this thing looks like a fireworks show. So I don't know shit about this rig because I've only been in a firehouse for a couple of hours. We pull out, and 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 I worked for officers that led by example. They didn't take your tools out of your hand, but they were first in and last out. Altman, because he didn't know what was going to happen, he took the – on the hard line on this, this dry chem rig we had, he took the line. He said, just back us up. Just back me up. He put the fire out with the 2,000 pounds of 4A powder. We rolled up the hose, got on the rig, and went back and looked like rock stars. But now what? it was an experience I'll, I'll, I'll never forget. It taught me many lessons. Well, how many guys did they ride with at that time in, in this? We went anywhere from six to eight. Oh, really? Six to eight on a shift? The lowest, yeah, the lowest we went on, on the rig was, was six. Wow. But there were days when we had, when there was no furloughs or vacation time, we had eight. What were the engines and, and the trucks running with then? I don't know, a regular engine and a truck. Uh, at that time, they were running with probably four and four. Four and four. But four, we had, we had four, the four, 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 an officer or four including you? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, a, an officer and four. Oh, okay. Right. I mean, I'm sorry, an officer and three. So the engines would have an engineer, an officer, and two firefighters. The trucks would have an officer and three firefighters. Sometimes they were with five. But right. when the contract came along, all that shit was solved. And what do they ride with today? What is it can be it can be five and five or four and five in a double house. We have uh, since I've been gone, they've increased the variances and the variances. They could run. They used to be able to run with thirty a day. Now it's up a little bit more, mm -hmm. where they can run. They don't run single engines with with less than four. That means a four and an officer. Um, but it's a double house, they might run the engine with 
you know, total of four, counting Osser, right. and a truck with five. And the squads run with usually run with six. How many? How, how many? How big is that department, Chicago? How, how many members? Got, uh, we I'm gone from there for quite some time, but they have. I'm still proud of it. Um, they have 96 engines. One's a floating engine, fireboat. Um, 61 trucks. Ten of those are tower ladders. Four heavy rescues. Uh, two small jet boats. Took over the dive program back from the police when. Uh, well, we still we still share it. That was a little riff we had. That's like the your. Uh, what do you call them? ESU cops. Those guys? Yeah. yeah. That's kind of, we had a little riff with the dive team with the police, but it's okay. It's, it's all good. We it's like all good. Up to 80 Competition is good. Uh, yeah. H how many members on there? What's the department? How many? Uh, uh, right now it varies. It might be 43 to 4,400 firefighters. Count, that's the chiefs on, uh, battalion, right. or chiefs on down. And then there's 600 some par single role paramedics. You know, the ALS programs, when I came on, it was BLS and they switched over to advanced life support ambulances and the paramedics have always been, the single role paramedics have always been a part of the fire department. Years ago, and, and, and not to my, my liking, but years ago, they weren't liked by a lot of people because I don't know why, but I can tell you this, um, I, I got to give credit to our paramedics because a lot of the times when firefighters make rescues, that ambulance, those paramedics were outside and they they had the finished product. They they saved the life by doing what they did. Yeah. And uh, I could never say anything bad about that program or our paramedics. Yeah, it's nice to have a paramedic out there if you're the guy getting carried out, no less, you know? <laughs> well, we, we, we fought for, when I was at the training academy, I fought with our deputy fire commissioner to get an ambulance responding to a working fire. You get a fireman hurt, we had to wait 20 minutes. So they oh, oh they don't it. send an ambulance on a on, Do they well, do that they now? Out. Yeah, 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 hell yeah. Year 2000, I think we started sending a Holy shit. ambulance out of working fire for firemen. Yeah, right. yeah, no, I got it. You know. now, now you get one for RIT, too, so it's it's great. It's advanced. It's it's better. Right. So w when you get to uh, Squad 1, <clears throat> uh, I mean, we always say that the, the 60s to the 70s are the war years. Was that comparable in Chicago, too? Got, uh, the cities were burning. And Absolutely. And it, it seemed to transform – you know, we had street boxes. They took the street boxes out, and in place of the street boxes, it seemed like the companies took over ambulance assist calls where they were running with the medics. Um, and that took, you know, their companies still, there's uh, engine 95 on the west side could have 25 runs and three fires in a day. They're doing ambulance assist and they're doing fires. And they have a medic and an EMT on there. They're an advanced life support engine. I don't know what, when I left, I think we had 55 out of the 96 engines that were ALS, advanced life support. And there might have been 15 or 20 of the truck companies that had paramedics and EMT, and they were advanced life support. Had all, everything you could do, everything but transport. So right. it's a long way. So how much work were you catching there? I mean, 77, you're in a squad. Yeah, what are you guys, rolling, are you guys rolling on on report of a fire or confirmed fire, the squad? No, we did. We had the, we were right. We were in Cabrini Green, right? The projects, our firehouse was in the projects north of downtown. So we did, we had the loop. We had a still alarm district, which was huge. We went to the Humboldt Park area, which they were burning up then. Then we had a still in box district. Then we had citywide 211s. We went on all extrications. Um, we were still part of the dive team. Uh, that was We did hazmat before it was hazmat. You know, we had the we had the level A suits that guys wouldn't go in today. They had duct tape on them and shit, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get it to that chlorine over there, that yeah, chlorine yeah. cloud over there. <laughs> green cloud. Don't be afraid. Just duct tape. A little more duct tape. Don't worry. Oh my oh, we, had a job, we had a chlorine job out on the southeast side, and our Lieutenant Altman, he wouldn't put – we had two suits, and both of them had duct tape and, and bubble gum oh, yeah. on them. He, no, that's a, he that's got in the suit right. and went up and shut the valve. That's this is about cool. right. Yeah, um, yeah. Wow. So you let you you learned the job in a hurry there because you were going to a ton of work. I was just going to say that, Coop. He had to learn all those. Yeah, I I, I, I learned my cousin Jerry McKee was on my shift and a wealth of knowledge. And just they just take you under their arm and you know here we go. You paired up six guys. Usually we split up in teams of two. Um, you know I was able to. A lot of guys didn't want to drive the lead rig because they didn't know the streets. After six months of being there, I said I'll be the second driver. I'll drive. I want to learn the streets. So I was fortunate enough to be the second up driver on that front rig. Um, and that's how you learn. Got to jump in there with both feet. How did they sp split it up in, in the squad? What were the positions? You have uh, an inside team, uh, outside depending team? At, 
you know, you when you went into busy and 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 I'll tell you guys this: when you went into busier areas, the squad filled in the low spots. When you go when you go with the crows, we call them the crows. Whether well, were the old timers or the guys that didn't want to do nothing, when you went out in certain areas, you ended up on the line. Yeah. And there were many times when our boss would say, let's take the two and a half. We're going with it. You know, we take two and a half in a lot. And then we had a big boss. His name was Al Prendergast. He'd say when the fire was out and it was time to overall, he, he was a loud man. He'd say, I want all the inside firemen out and I want all the outside firemen in. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's how he rode with it, you know. He, uh, wow. That could be a shirt. <laughs> yeah. I like that too. Let them yeah. go in the overhaul and, and, you know. Let the, the guys that took their took their ass up and come out and take a yeah, blow. That's, a, that's you know how it is here, Chief, too. We say that a lot. A lot of times, you know, the guys do the right thing for the most part, and there's not much work to do if it's a one-room job. But there are times when you show up and there's a little bit of work to be done and you fill the gaps, whether it's taking off bars or putting up ladders. Uh, or, it, always yeah. seemed, it always seemed the further we drove, like into no man's land, the more work we did. You know? yeah. Same here. Yeah, and and the other the big thing that and and I and I give this out to the guys that are on on squad companies and rescues like that now. What I was taught, and I and as a lieutenant at squad two for seven years, if you 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 know you got two buildings going and you you think you need a line, but well, we just go take one. You know, you go to the pump operator, we call them engineers. You say, hey, buddy, can you take another line off? Absolutely. But when we were done, we picked the line up, bet it, and Pack put it, it up. Down. Yeah, because the up. next time we went to ask for a line, you know what he'd say if you didn't pick pick, pick his well, own. Yeah. Right. So I mean, that's that's what you do, and you say thank you when you're going up a stairway with the crows. <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me, and then you end up with the line, or you end up doing the search and they didn't do. Crows. There's another one, Ruffy. Crows. Why? Why do they call them crows? <laughs> Where'd that come ah. from? They were just. They were. You know, there was only a handful of them, but those were the guys that didn't want to do anything. So they called them crows. You don't know where oh, they came yeah. from. Oh, crows. <laughs> when I was a fan, when I was a fan, the engine they changed an engine company into forty five because they were busy. Forty five, you nobody ever got in a hose bed. We did because we were fans, but nobody on another company ever got in that hose bed. You betted your own hose. You were proud same, of it. Same, That's same, company yeah, pride, absolutely. bro. Same company same pride. Thing. Same thing. Wow. How long did you stay there, Chief? SS one. I was only there a couple of years and I got promoted. Um, Promoted to lieutenant. Our, our group that came on, since then they've changed it. You have to, I believe, you have to have five years in rank before you can take a promotional exam or take the promotion. But at that time, there wasn't a test for ten years, so we hit it. There was a bunch of us that came on together to hit it just right, and were able to be promoted young lieutenants. So um, that was an experience. I worked with World War II veterans, and I was their lieutenant. Um, wow, learning experience, and and I, I pass that on to people because stay humble. You know. It, Thank God I was taught by people always lead by example. When they're doing housework, you take your shirt off, you're doing housework. When you're checking the rig, you're right in there getting your fingers dirty. That's what it's all about because you show your people that you give a shit. So that's Leading that's by example. Yep. Yeah, man. No doubt. Uh, so, I mean, we we talk about this a lot. You know, if you got on in, in what, 76, 77, did you work with a lot of World War II vets? Yes. Yes, unique bunch of individuals. Yeah, man, we say that all the time to guys who have been hired in this in the early seventies, mid seventies. You know, they saw they saw stuff that I just speak for me personally that I, I I never saw, and they they were they were tough men. They were tough men. They didn't, you know. You think about some people crying about, uh, you know, I don't do toilets. I'm just just talking about mundane jobs. They did it all. They were on busy companies. Those rigs stood tall. They were proud of their stuff. Yeah. And, and that's what I learned from them. So did even, you even the Vietnam guys, when I got on, I, I had Vietnam guys, those guys, yeah. I, you know, they just felt like this was gravy. You know, everything was gravy. Uh, you know, like yeah, when you, know, you like crawl through a ju jungle yeah. and, <laughs> and then they say, Hey, you got to go do BI. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> BI. Really? I got to run in that bur burning building over there. Would you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. you learn, you learn fast. And I, I didn't like fireworks, but a couple of our guys on SS one like fireworks and you don't blow fireworks off in a bunk room when you got Vietnam vets sleeping. Oh, yeah, no. that might not go good. Right. No. And here's Tony Bucker up in the chat. 1983, I was able to fan with Lieutenant Hoff on squad two. What an experience. Yeah, Tony's a great man. Yes, he great is. Man. He's 100% fire department. Fucking oh, Tony yeah. Bucker. 
so how, how how was it though? Like uh, so seventy seven. You had two years on, right? And you said you're a lieutenant for guys like these World War Two vets, bro. How uh, it's got to be a little bit of an uncomfortable feeling, right? You, at first it was, but but I I, I just uh, it was a com uncomfortable feeling being a lieutenant to have that position, and it took a long time to get used to being in that position. But to work with those guys, they made me feel comfortable. I think a lot of us that were young, they made us feel comfortable. So it wasn't they weren't you know some guys were bitter because they didn't get made uh, you know whatever the case may be. But if you come to work every day, and this is what I was taught, and this is what I lived, and this is why I survived as well as I did is when I come to work, I was about the fire department. I wasn't about, you know, personalities, politics, and egos will destroy everything. Mm. Those are three things that you don't, that's in the firehouse. Yeah, I mean, we talk about politics all the time. I don't come kid on, me. man. <laughs> I know that guy. <laughs> Same guy. Same guy. <laughs> I love it. But, uh, well, that's you, you feather that stuff with with the older guys. They were just they were good. They didn't. You know, they were <laughs> working in Disney World, right? Every day. It yeah, was some rougher than others, but so yeah, you uh, you, you bounced for about a year, right? You covered, and then you got assigned to Squad Two. Now, where I was, was fortunate enough to get the squad two. So where was that as opposed you know, squad one? Were they at a different side of town or uh, yeah. squad, might squad be a little one. salty? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the salty picture of the year right there, bro. Good lord. <laughs> that was a good fire. <laughs> um squad one was downtown, squad two went to the west side. Right. Um I had put snorkel squad one. I was a relief lieutenant, and I had put snorkel squad one out of service. In the morning and at five o'clock at night, we were in service in squad two. They reorganized. We had a commissioner called, uh, called his name was Bill Blair from California. He left town when we had all the cold weather fires. That tells you a lot about him. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, he reorganized, restructured the uh, department. We had divisions. It went to districts. And he brought a, a gentleman in from the police department. And that's why we had, uh, instead of division marshals, it went to deputy district chiefs. We went from divisions to districts. Uh, reorganized the numbers of the battalions, changed the squads. This guy wanted to, you know, it was after the war, the strike, and the, the Jane Byrne brought this guy in to shake the department up. And it really, it, you know, I don't give a shit what number you give me. We're going to work. So that's, you know, that's what it was about. So how many how many squads were there originally? Uh, back in my dad's day, there were 13 squads. Holy oh, shit. Three wow. snorkels, Three snorkel squads. Wow. Right. Back in the day of my grandfather... There were rescues. Uh, he was a he put. I don't know what year it was because he retired in the 30s, I think. But he put Rescue Company One. They, when they disbanded him, he was a captain of Rescue Company One on the South Side of Chicago at 62nd and Green. So, and then they go from 13 when, uh, to when you when you go to uh, Squad Company Two. Then they went to flying squads. <laughs> they had seven flying manpower squads. They a call fly, it. a flying squad. Is that what it was? That's what they call it. It was a mat, it was a maintenance study that was done about how to, you know, better efficiency in the fire service, and you know, it was a manpower thing. So the squad, the flying squads, ran with five or six, and they would they would go to every working fire and try. You know, that's when they were running with four and four, thinking that's going to help. Well, you need guys on the scene in the beginning stages, not when they're running twenty minutes to get there. You know what I mean? Oh, so it was so bean bean counters. Squad. That was a bean counter maneuver. Oh, hands down. <laughs> Right. Hands down. Sad, Love sad, sad. Counted. Yeah, they're great. They're you great. Ruin so how, you so how, many, how many, when you were in squad company two, how many squads were there then? Uh, the reorganization, there were six squads. And that's what there is today, six squads? They're down to four. Holy mackerel. Squad one is downtown. Squad two is on the near northwest side. Squad, uh, there is no squad three. Squad one, squad two, squad uh, five is on the south side. They're the busiest. And Squad 7 is at the airport, and they take a section of the city. Um, they come off the airport proper to go to fires. Hmm. Oh, there you are on Squad 2. Uh, that, you know, when you talk about being a young officer, uh, I, I that was our engineer in the, in the close. We came with this. We got the snorkels back in 84, and the only ones we had were the 75-foot snorkels, and they came with engineers because they had pumps on them. So Tommy Walsh was our engineer. And every one of those people in that picture that are smiling, 
One is crazier than the other, but one is a better fireman. <laughs> <laughs> like That's this. usually how it works. That's usually <laughs> how it works. <laughs> if I had dog collars for all of them, <laughs> uh, I'm not but I wouldn't I, I, crawling down a hallway take any one of them. The best. Right, guys, did you guys work in the same? Like, uh, what was your chart like? Did you work with the same guys all the time? Yes, we have we have three platoons: first, second, and third shift. And uh, you would work together all the time. So those were your guys right there. Yes, those were my clowns. Yeah. <laughs> were um, Were you guys on uh, flight one eighty one? On that I job? was flight one ninety one. Was it one ninety one? Because someone asked about it and they said one eighty one. I, I was I, I was a uh, I was driving a squad snorkel squad one that day. Uh, real quick story: O'Hare Field had uh, when they got a standby. In those days, it went to a still in box alarm, and squad snorkel squad one out of Cabrini Green would take that jaunt. We'd get in the rig and head out to O'Hare Field till they they canceled the standby and struck out the box. Well, this particular day I'll never forget. It was a Friday. It was May twenty fifth, nineteen seventy nine. Ten after three in the afternoon, still in box alarm, O'Hare Field for the plane crash. So we pull out of the firehouse and we had a relief lieutenant, and we look in the sky and it's like holy shit. We ain't getting turned around on this one. And we went out there and there was, I think there was 275 dead. Uh, we actually, on our, our, on our rescue rig, we had a 300 gallon booster tank with a hard line, um, which we pulled in. There was no hydrants out there. So we were putting bodies out with hand pumps and a hard line and they were refilling it. Um, and then they had the paddy wagons lined up and we were going to start bagging, bagging them. And then the NTSB came in and said, no, it's a crime scene. So we were there about three hours. Chief, I'm not familiar with that. What, what did it crash at the airport? Into where, where did it crash? Right on takeoff, right across the street. I think it was Higgins, right across Higgins Road. There was an old airplane hangar that was a, a garage for repair car repair cars. That's it, right there. The end. Uh, one of the engines fell off. Holy shit! It was. Yeah, uh, here's, the, here's the result. What year is that? Uh, May 25th, 1979, at 15 10 hours. Wow. Now that was uh, wasn't that the anniversary? You were saying something in the pre-show, wasn't that um... bizarre? Bizarre little side note that that I picked up on May twenty fifth, nineteen fifty. My father was a firefighter on Squad Three at Fifty Third and Wabash, and they had the Green Hornet wreck. And the Green Hornet was a street. Oh, that's what it was, right? Uh, there's a picture of my father I think there. We got a picture of that, Pete, of the, yeah. of the street but car. My father was on Squad Three, and. The Green Hornet struck a gasoline tanker, and there were 33 dead. Um, and it was the same day. And how many wow. years? Ago. So it was kind of bizarre. He was on a squad. I was on a squad. Um, just kind of weird. Yep. There, now, which one's your dad? All the way on the left? Um, to the left there. That's my dad. Cool. Tom Brady cool. is a, the other guy in the front picture there. He's a tough man. But, yeah, mm -hmm. it's Ben Barrett taking the bodies out. And that was the same day, man. That is a weird uh, yeah. side note. There are no coincidences. Yeah, can, I, can I say something? Of course. Of course. Uh, yeah, this is your show, my friend. I'm kind of thirsty. Can we say jag off? <laughs> hey, jag off. Hey, jag off. Hey, Ruffy, what's up, jag off? I'll go home and get your fucking shine box. But <laughs> but <laughs> Did anybody, <laughs> did anybody survive that plane crash, uh, Chief? No, um, the whole point. Not not to be gory, but we found one, one, one body that was not severely burned. Everybody else was, you know, it was loaded with jet fuel. So wow, there man. were a couple of people killed on the ground, I believe. Ugh, um, what a mess! Yeah, it was it was a it was, a, it was an interesting uh, run. No boy, no. Yeah, takeoff. You're full of the thing is full of fuel, right? So that's a mess. God Almighty. Oh, so after Squad Two, you get promoted to captain. Uh, you spent some time in Squad Two, huh? Seven years. You must have done a ton of work there too, man. Yes, it was. It was good. It was interesting. It was fun. I, you know, to the day I left, I enjoyed getting up and going to work every day. But going there with the same cast of characters, we were like gypsies, though. We were in five different firehouses in seven years. <laughs> really? Yes. Why were they so, moving you around so much? Uh, they changed the districts. They we went down from six squads to four squads, or actually five. But uh, I got to tell you this real quick. This one story. It was kind of a 
a house with mixed older guys and younger guys, but they were going to move us in this firehouse and they didn't have enough room in the bunk room. It was, it had an engine truck. The deputy district chief was like the division marshal. Um, so being the characters that we were, we come back from a nasty fire. We were supposed to move in there in like two weeks and we knew the routine. They had their own TV room downstairs. Beautiful. So we come back from a fire. We're dirty, filthy, dirty, so I go in there with my guys with a tape measure and they're all in the TV room. It's like nine o'clock at night. So we turn a light on one of the older guys on the truck. He was a, just a moody old bastard. He, what are you doing? So we're measuring this out. This is going to be our bunk room. Like we're <laughs> the room. Well, I'll tell you what, in there, it wasn't pretty. The guy wrote a the lieutenant on the engine, wrote a form to the, which was a two from to the bosses saying every time that we got a max squad, we, procured a Mac that was going to walk through back so we could change for dive. And it's, it's the diesel smoked the house up. This guy sit at the desk and smoke a cigar, but he didn't like the diesel. Yeah. So, I mean, the whole time we were in there, they hated us. <laughs> I, some of my clowns, they did some outstanding things. You know, window day, snowing out. I said, don't, no, don't worry about the windows. Just wipe the window sills off. Well, the one window said, do not open. It was a flip open window. So one of my all stars flips it open and the hinges broke, it falls, the glass breaks out. So they clean all the, they don't tell me, they clean all the glass up, they put the frame back in, and that is the guy, the crabby guy that drove the truck, that's his bed. Well, it's <laughs> like a big guy. <laughs> so he goes up in the afternoon to take a little power nap, and his bed's covered in snow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this, squad, this squad did it. You know what it is, bro? No matter where you go, it's the same, like they say, man. Uh, same that's same right. I, I can't. Uh, some hate, of my hate, haters yeah. gonna hate. Haters gonna hate. And, and you know what else they're gonna hate? They're gonna hate stuff like this right here. Because you guys do this shit. What's oh <laughs> what's that? That's from Tony Buckrup. Tony Buckrup said. Oh, that's, that's uh myself and Jimmy Clark and Jimmy Clark, show. he said, yes. What are you doing? Inverting yeah, little, pardon? You doing a little inversion there coming down. Yeah, we were doing a little thrill show for the neighborhood. Nice. Set up by the commissioner who was a squad guy at the time and when he saw us come out of the baskets upside down, he almost uh, fell over. <laughs> nice package. <laughs> <laughs> he said awesome package. Awesome stuff, man. Awesome yeah. stuff. Where are we oh, in the timeline, Kev? Oh, we're good. Uh, we're, we're making headway here. I just wanted you to ask you, him, uh, when they moved you around, were you were you guys ever in a single house by yourselves, like Rescue 2, or you were always with regular units? Only at Snorkel Squad 1 when I first came on. That house was the commissioner's uh, executive assistant ran out of the second floor there. Right. So our bunk room was on the first floor. The rigs were on the first floor. The kitchen was on the second floor. And that, that house to the battalion chiefs was off limits. They could come in and collect the paperwork, but they couldn't go upstairs. So that you, how do you think that went over big? <laughs> yeah. Not so much. But that was, that, I mean, that was a wonderful place. We, we were our own patrol boys. That, got, uh, that is great, man. That's a... So uh, let's see where we are. Uh, then you get a sign, you get promoted to captain, right? In '87. Uh, well, I had I, I wanted to talk about an incident I had at Squad Two. Yeah, go with it. Uh, um, burn slides. And the reason I want to talk about this, why I think it's important, is because you want. I made a mistake as a company officer. I made a mistake, and I was the one that paid for it. None of my members did. And the reason I bring this up is it's okay to be aggressive. It's okay to be aggressive. We want you to be aggressive. But they have a reason for what you're doing. What, I, what happened here was we were on our third fire of the night. My adrenaline was pumping. Um, like I said, our third fire of the night, we're helping the engine company at the second fire break down in line. The alley guy comes running down. Hey, my attic's on fire. Two and a half story frame, 75 foot deep with an enclosed back porch. So myself and the engine officer run down. I got a tank on. It's an MSA. I got the sport model, but my tank's empty from the first fire. So I ditch it in the stairwell. So we go upstairs. I said, as soon as you get, it was a one partition wall. Couldn't see behind it to search. I said, as soon as you get water on the line, I'll go for the window. Well, the, at that time it was inch and a half, not inch and three quarter. So we get the line. He got just enough line to go over his head at the top stair. And they're pulling the line. What happened was he got water. I shoot ahead of him 15 feet. He's screaming, I lost the water. I lost the water. So I'm aggressive. I'm not thinking. And I go for the window anyway. Well, what happened was when, when I took the window, it lit up. Um, 
I had second and third degree burns over 30% of my body. By the time I got back, it was either I hung out the window and my engineer pulled a snorkel around. He said, I looked up and I'm screaming hand pumps because we got to have some water. He says the next time he looked up, it was fire blowing out the window and he didn't know what happened. Well, I was either going to go out the window or come back the way I came. I figured going back the way I came would be the safest. Dove down the stairs. My driver, Tommy Banks, ended up on the line uh, to no avail for me. Um, little story about this. They, I get downstairs. Uh, battalion chief that took care of me was on the ambulance that night, Mikey Burns. They cut all my clothes off me in the street. They gave me the best care they could. They take me to Illinois Masonic, which was a trauma center. Doctor looks at me. I'm face down. Doctor says, you're going to a burn unit. We got to get a helicopter. So by that time, my brother is off duty. He shows up at the hospital and I'm laying face down and I'm like, a, I, I'm, they couldn't give me enough morphine. Mm. So they said, nurses and doctors, you got to move your cars. And I hear it, but I don't know what's going on because I'm out of it. The helicopter's coming down. They, at that time, Illinois Masonic was, it's been remodeled since then and redone, but they didn't have a heliport. So all the nurses and doctors had to move their cars, cars out of their little lot. And that's where the helicopter landed. So I'm face down. My brother's holding my other hand as they're wheeling me to the helicopter. And I hear the nurse say, oh, my God, how did you land that helicopter between those wires? And I'm laying there like a dog shitting razor blade shaking. And I'm thinking, <laughs> God, I just burnt and I'm going to die in the helicopter. <laughs> oh, my God. So how long were you in the burn center for, Chief? 21 days. 21 um, days, man. How long? Unit, I, I learned I earned a new respect for nurses. I always respected them, but I... Doctors, yes, but the nurses were unbelievable. They had eight beds in that in that unit, and they never stopped because you have to do dressing changes every four to six hours. Yeah, it's a lot Jesus. of work. Right? Some How another, <clears throat> but our coalition with with that, me getting burned is um, the picture you saw on my head. My head swelled up the size of a basketball. I couldn't get a straw in my mouth hardly to to eat for a week just to drink stuff, and uh, but it may have been about six days in. My wife at that time brought my daughter, um, who was six, and my son was five, the same age I was when my dad got killed. They brought him in to room to see me for five minutes. And um, I'll never forget my son saying, that's not dad. Really? I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't talk very well, so he couldn't understand my voice, but he said, that's not dad. And all went through my mind was, what did I do to myself? You know, my dad yeah. died when I was five, and now I'm going to do this to him and her. Right. So anyway, that was kind I, of weird. Chief, How long were you out of work for, Chief? Well, that's another story, if you want to hear it. Hell yeah. Three months. Oof. Um, I was, I that's went to the, well, I, I lied. Uh, <laughs> uh, I got burned. Um, you had to wear Job's garment. And what it is, if you're not familiar with Job's garment, it's a compression fit stocking. Yep. And I was burned here, my butt, my back. Uh, my face was uh, I had a little skin grass here, but that was just blotchy. But the back was the worst. And uh, I had to wear these Job's garments for 24 months. So I went to the fire department doctor with the Job's garment on. And he was a general practitioner. And he, said, he never talked to the burn doctor. He said, he just looked at the paperwork. And he said, uh, as long as you had that Job's garment on, you can't work. And I'm thinking, no way. And that was the first thing I asked the burn doctor, can I ever go back to fire duty? And he goes, he says, we'll see. So what I did was being stupid. Uh, the next time I went the next month, I was only laid up three months. The third month I went to the, the fire department doctor. I didn't wear the Job's garment. And he said, oh, you don't have to wear it anymore? I said, no, sir. Well, I had five sets to wear at the firehouse. He let me back to work. But what the Job's garment does, it, it, it compresses the skin so the outer skin isn't like chicken skin. It doesn't pull off. I was going to say, did, well, did it screw up your uh, scarring, not having that on? Uh, no, not really. But my very first run back in squad two was a chlorine leak. Oh, <laughs> shit. Get the duct tape. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Chief, I, I got to ask you, and, and this is stupid question one of the night, but I got to ask, um, if, if you could describe what that felt like getting burned like that. Like what, what is some, what is something like, is that in almost inexplicable to like anyone who hasn't experienced it? Like, what is that like? I, I can't describe it. The pain was when I was in there for 21 days, they let me out early because they needed the bed for a child that was called it. I said, I'll go home. But I had to go back every day for, at that time they did the hottest water you could stand. They'd put you in the tank. And they, when I was able to open my mouth, she'd give me a scuba face piece 
our mouthpiece, I'd go in underwater for 20 minutes and then she'd debreed. They'd pick the skin off you. Oh and, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't wish a burn on anyone. Trust uh -huh. me. And I know there's, there's members on your job and our job that were f burned far worse than I was. And I can't imagine what they went through. And I, and I watched the thing on Timmy Stackpole. I, I was crying the whole time. It's amazing to me that you sustain that type of injury. And the first thing on your mind is how quick can I get back? <laughs> it, it, it just tells the mentality of firemen, right? Yeah, there isn't any. <laughs> <laughs> he ain't lying. <laughs> you really got the civil service. That's why they said that. <laughs> Fire department doctor actually asked me, he says, you know, you, you have the option of going off on three quarter. And I said, ain't happening. Wow. And I ain't going to do a desk job either. I was going to say, how much time did you have then? You didn't, you didn't have. You, 84 to 76. So I had eight. Yeah, it's early on, pretty yeah. early. Yeah. Good guy, wow. man. It's huh. unbelievable. Really is amazing, Whew. amazing recovery, there, Chief. So and, and uh, wait, see the what? Okay, so Chief, the end result of that was, um, didn't they interview you about your back for a character? Um, there was a Robert De Niro pit played uh, uh, Rimgale in the movie Backdraft, and there's a scene in there where he takes he was burned in one of the fires, and he takes his shirt off. And they had come, uh, Bill Cosgrove was a guy that was a lia liaison for, for uh, Robert De Niro. He was on our job, great fireman. He said, hey, can, do you mind? It's kind of a personal thing, but can we take pictures of your back? And I go, for what? He goes, that they're going to use those pictures for the burns, for De Niro's burns in the movie. I said, yeah, whatever they want to do. Obviously, his burns in the movie were more severe looking than mine were, but that's what they based it off of. Shadow. Yeah, nope. <laughs> you said you actually you sat down with uh, Ron Howard, though, right? They said Ron Howard came to my. I was a relief chief. My brother was a captain of Tower Ladder Ten. He came to the firehouse and sat with us for a couple of hours, and he asked us our whole story. Just some of it, what we explained. What I explained tonight. We explained to him, and he what what a nice man, what an intense guy. And then to follow that up, uh, I get a call from Cosgrove, who was on our job, and he was De Niro's escort. The whole time during the movie, he said, hey, De Niro wants to talk to you. Let's interview you. Yeah, tell him to come by the firehouse. I was in a battalion with a single engine and an ambulance. I said, tell him to come by for coffee. He goes, he doesn't like crowds. I go, there's not a crowd here. He says he doesn't like other people around. I said, oh, get it. So we went in Humboldt Park in the buggy, and he, he taped me, audio taped me for two hours. He interviewed me. No shit. I got a new respect for actors when they research their parts. Yeah. Oh, it was yeah. Really, really intense. Oh, um, really? So... It was uh, it was interesting, but like I said, my brother and myself never wanted anything to do with the movie because it was too close to home. Yeah. Right? Did you go see the movie when it came out, though? Oh yeah, you yeah, did. yeah. It, uh, it's uh, based in Chicago. That movie, right? It's uh, yes, it yeah, yes. Uh, we had you know we had a couple of guys that were Steve Chikorotis, Kevin Casey, Cedric Young. They were, they had uh, Steve was uh, assisting them with the movie. Kevin Casey, who was a tremendous fireman from the West Side, he was in a lot of parts of the movie. He's a big, strong guy, uh, pipe fitter on his day off. And then <laughs> Cedric Young was a guy on Truck 11, where I was. Hmm. You I guys was, are a real gluttons for punishment. You know, on your day off, you're pipe fitting or laying concrete. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Jesus, Louises. Keeps oh, you humble. Yeah. Keeps you humble. Keeps, Keeps you humble. humble. I like it. Yeah. All right, so now we go to promotion to captain. You're promoted and you're bouncing around District 5, right? Yes, I was at uh, an engine in a truck for several months and then they assigned me to uh, Truck 11. And where is that? Is that uh, anywhere near? Who are they running with? They don't run it with 15. They're the next truck north of Truck 15 where I used I to hang out. you were going to say that. 15. So you guys are doing some work there as well. We were a project. Oh, sorry, wrong truck. Um, <laughs> we, we, did a, we were the busiest at that time oh, in the city. Uh, we were busy because we had the projects. We did elevators, incinerators, and fires. Um, when I walked in the house, I had two brand new candidates with me my first day. That's truck 15, where I was a, a fan. That's not truck. Oh, that's whatever you want to be captain. He's in truck 11, Petey. You had the right picture. Oh, I did? Yeah. I thought we were talking about truck 15. Sorry, boys. It's a lot of photos here. I apologize. Well, when I went to truck 11, I walked in the house, and it was a uh, – mix of black and white guys working together mm -hmm. and uh they had had some 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 tough times there and when i walked in i had two brand new candidates on the truck 
and there was a candidate on the engine company. The engine company officer was a classmate of mine. Um, and I knew, I knew there was a lot of shit going on in the house. And why I tell you this story is because I go back to my days as a punk hanging around truck 15 and 45 when all those black and white men worked together and got along. When I walked in this house, I rang the bell at roll call. I said, let everybody in the kitchen. I said, I understand there's no meal club here. I said, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to have a meal club. And that some of the guys, the older guys that their heads down, I said, fellas, I understand there's a lot of bullshit. I said, I don't operate that way. I said, if nobody wants to cook, I'm cooking, but we're eating together. There you and go. The guy that was cooking raised his hand. He says, hey, Cap, I'll cook. Um, it, we were up all night at this company. Guys stood, you know, the guys, the firemen had to stay and watch us after 2,200 hours, and we were running. So there was the point where in the afternoon, if, if, if it's downtime for them, if a guy wants to go work out, he wants to go take a nap, whatever he wants to do, it's their downtime. But I had expectations, and I gave them to him, and I asked the older guys. My senior guys in the truck were black guys. I asked them, hey, would you go out, give me an hour or two a day to take these guys out to vacant buildings? Whatever you want. If you treat people like human beings and you treat them good and you treat them like ladies and gentlemen, it's not about performing for you as the officer. It's about performing for the job. And they did. And I had a successful outcome there. And it's not because of me. It's because of what I was taught. Yep. That's well, what you, you started on. right away with the I'll cook, which is leading by example. We get back to that again, right? You, you brought that up earlier. Leading by example. It puts pressure on them to do the right thing without making them do the right thing, right? And, and I treated them like gentlemen. You know, if somebody had to go somewhere, somebody had something to do, I got it. See you. You're on my dime. Plus, it, when you come in, like, when you're coming in fresh like that, you give a, a, a place a little bit of uh, a breath of fresh air kind of thing, and you, and you kind of set the, set the rules and set the, the, the train back on the track because, you know, like you said, as time goes on, things, you know, you get the personalities get involved, the egos get involved, whatever gets oh, involved. Boy. And and then it, it's tough to get back with the same, you know, that's why they trade coaches and, <clears throat> and they, uh, on certain teams because you need a fresh face to come in and hopefully uh, put everybody yeah. on the same page playing for the same team. Yeah. Strong leadership, though, is what it is. And, and, and the bottom line is what, you know, if guys don't, they don't see eye to eye about politics or something in the firehouse, the bottom line is when the bell rings. And I can tell you, every one of those guys in that house gave 110% of the fire. So that, what else can you ask for? Nothing. Have a good day. Yeah, right. That's I it. mean, you're not going to like everybody anyway, <laughs> right, Chief? I mean, in the end, you're not always going to like everybody. It's, uh, but you still have to do perform the job, right? Like yeah, you're not you know. going to go out to dinner with them on your day off, but right, exactly. But when you're you got to love, you got to love them. Correct. Yep, I agree. So how long do we spend at uh, Truck 11 as a captain? It looks like uh, not a long time, right? You got uh, <laughs> assigned chief uh, in 89, so you're there big for about big what? Chief, you know, big, big chief, chief now. Again, big that chief. Again, it was every year. Same, that same group of guys that we were fortunate enough to hit that exam, we took the BC exam, and we and they, they, they promoted uh, – they were so short BCs, they promoted 44 in one crack. So we I got promoted to battalion chief. I relieved for nine years citywide. Nine years, you were wow, you were bounced around for nine years, and it's finally uh assigned to battalion two. Yes, I was assigned to Chinatown. Um, I didn't request it, I was sent there. Um, and I was there two years, and we had a change in commissioners. And the commissioner that was coming in asked me if I wanted to be the director of training, so I took over that chore as a director of training for a fire department. Oh, that's uh, in 2000, right? After you were right. assigned. So you were, the, you were assigned to, in 97 to Battalion 2 in Chinatown. Correct. So there's, there's way too many Asians here. I got to get the hell out of here. <laughs> <laughs> no, you I didn't. Can, I can say I that. Did. My wife's Asian. I'm allowed to say that. Stop it. <laughs> Keep going with that one. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I right. Do, maybe right. you can. All yeah, right. I can. I can. And my yeah. kids are Asian. My kids are half Asian, so I can go with that. So you, you become uh, the district chief to the training like the academy i guess correct so when i had uh i had a staff down there two of them were right the guys right underneath me were both at squad two on another shift at the time i was there um I had clown faces and everything they were character <laughs> <laughs> they, they were hard uh, one became the commissioner one was uh <laughs> jose santiago and the other was uh, steve chicarotas 
and they were my my underlings right directly under me at the academy and we had uh we had gone out to new york mm-hmm. myself and a guy named rick column and we went through your confidence course um i think it was in 85 when we had gone through it and it was nine stations wearing an scba darked out you had to get through the goal was to get you guys probably remember it you had to get through each station before you you ran out of air right and every station that was there is where one of your guys got killed so it wasn't bullshit. it was a real deal right, real scenarios right so when i went out there i was so impressed we built one on a fifth floor of the academy um and we were able to institute a writ program we trained 4300 people in two years um with rapid intervention and then we became you guys called it fast we call it writ the right. writ was was put in effect. and it was done through the help of many but we were able to accomplish that um and when did that come online, Chief? Early in the early nineties or late eighties? Uh, well, we did the training when I was at the training academy oh, in two thousand one or two. So sometime during that, uh, I don't know the time frame exactly, but oh. yeah. yeah, I think we came online like in the mid nineties, if I remember. What the fast truck? Yeah, the fast truck. Yeah, I think so. Somewhere on the in the mid nineties. <clears throat> yeah. The, what, so where is their academy? Is it one place? Just like the, we have the Rock, they have a, an academy somewhere. It's over a there? very a very small building, and it's uh, right where the Great Chicago Fire was uh, supposedly started. It's right south of the Loop downtown. Really? Uh, we've outgrown it tenfold. Right now, they're supposedly building a training police police fire training center on the west side, right next to the garbage dumps. Go figure. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it's over there. There's a bunch of jackoffs over there. Hey! Oh, yeah, that was a, that was a, that was a running joke with Coops. He's like, "We're here, Ruffy. We're out in the fresh air. You smell it? Yeah, I yeah. smell it. Yeah, <laughs> right next to the sewer plant. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. So you're out there. How long are you there for? You're there for three years. That's a decent amount of time. Uh, right? Almost three, just shy of three years. I had a little situation where. Uh, oh, situations. We oh like boy. situations. You didn't get lifted, about. did you? I lifted myself. Oh boy. I had a. Not, the fire commissioner uh, was an extremely knowledgeable, good guy. His name was Jim Joyce. He was, he was a guy uh, that set up our program to get new rigs because our rigs were beat up, and he did a lot of great things. But I had a situation with, uh, we have a group called Gold, the Gold Badge Society, and that's the, the widows and family members of light of duty deaths. Father Mulcrone, actually, our chaplain, started it. Long story short, we were there to dedicate. There's a park south of McCormick Place. It's, it's the Gold Badge Park. And uh, we were there to dedicate it. And the academy gets, you know, always gets the details for Saturdays for the truck going out and doing flag. We had all that stuff. So I had a guy that was down there for engineers training. I didn't bring him down there. He was down there when I got there. Uh, during the national anthem, this is before people were kneeling. This guy's in the background and he's sitting in a chair because he was there to help unload chairs and stuff. And he was in his summer summer dress uniform, forgot his hat, so he had a lieutenant's hat on. He wasn't a lieutenant. So I'm I'm, you know, we're we're at attention, hand salute, and I'm standing with the commissioner, and I look over and I see this guy sitting down. And I'm like, You gotta be kidding me. So we get back to the academy, I grab my great grab him out. Me and him in a drill yard, and I rip him a new asshole. I said, you're gone. You're out of here. That's disrespectful, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I got to go through the chain of command. So I call a deputy fire commissioner at overseas training, and he, he, I says, here's the deal. I want this guy gone. I don't care where you put him. He ain't staying here. And uh, a week later, I got a phone call, and he says, he's not going anywhere. His sponsor wouldn't let, let like that. And I said, what do you mean? It was a politician who put him there. We got him, you know, to, we call it the Marshall line. He got Marshall line there. Mm. Um, and I said, well, I'm going to tell you something. And I thought this would work, but it didn't. I said, either he's gone or I'm gone. <laughs> They're like, all right, Bobby, see you later. <laughs> Thanks so for everything. I, uh, I left the academy and went to the Fort <laughs> Wow. Well, that you guy, that guy is a real jerk. I can tell you hey. that. Hey. Hey. Probably says stuff like, "Come on, man!" And uh, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I um, believe in karma. I believe in karma, and the tables round. Two years later, he got fired for drugs. Oh, what a ah, shock! That's see, shocking. I feel much better already. I'm gonna have yeah, a drink for that. So, yeah. you know, that guy when, was you, pissing me when off. you get sponsored <laughs> and things come easy, that's that's how you respect the yeah. job. You know, True story, life place. story. You know, you, I took a, a double demotion, but you know what? That's okay. I went back to concrete. 
Yeah, <laughs> warehouse of concrete. So from your, we have a picture of that guy, right? Who taught you the concrete? His, uh, his, his ex. That was my ex father in law. I got gotcha. you. Uh, yeah, we didn't talk about him. We got to talk about him. That guy. He he was also uh, a fireman, wasn't he? He was a retired as a deputy <laughs> district chief. Mm -hmm. um, he was he was a father figure to many, but definitely a father father figure to me besides being my father-in-law at the time but he put myself my buddy and his son when we were in high school we went to trade school at night to learn how to become cement finishers he did it for my son and he did it for another generation he was a korean war veteran a, a decorated korean war veteran when he came home from korea he was shot up he's a big strong man he was a big strong man god rest his soul but he was shot up they said he'd never walk again well he proved them wrong like carrying 20 um, pounds of cement, you know. Uh, and he had, you know, he had five children. My brother-in-laws were on a job. Hmm. I love them. They're great people. Um, but he he was a mentor to many, but he he was beyond a mentor to me. He he just, he put everything in perspective when it came to work ethic. It's always those war vets. Always. It's always yeah. the same. What's it, what was his name, uh, Chief? What was his name? Jack, Jack Gallipo. It shouldn't it be like Gallipolini or something if he's doing concrete. I mean, if he's doing concrete. <laughs> he's got to have a vowel at the end of his name, no? Well, when he, he would. Uh, maybe I, I better not say this. No, oh, you can't. Go ahead. We don't care. Some of the finishers, what he called them, the guys that did the curb and gutter. Yeah. Short leggers. <laughs> short leggers because they didn't have to bend over when you're doing the curb. <laughs> most of those guys were. Most of those guys were short. Most of the guys were short. <laughs> Oh, so that's the guy who helped you with the concrete. So that's why you went back. It says right here, September 2003, back as a battalion chief and assigned to battalion four. Correct. That's a, you know, that's the way it goes. Got you. Got to stand up for what you think is right. I could sleep at night. Um, oh yeah. yeah. People say, "What are you doing? Are you nuts? Yeah. Are you crazy? No, I'm not. I'm just. I can sleep at night." Yeah. Little did this guy know that he was going to set the trend for Colin Kaepernick by sitting down in his fat ass on while the uh, national <laughs> anthem was going on, right? And he had, he was clueless. He didn't know. He, he just that's where he was. He was out in left field somewhere. Yeah, and now he's probably out on uh, who knows whatever. All right. All right. So now you get promoted to district chief, district one. So that's like uh, I guess in our in our circles that would be like a deputy chief, correct? Or, it would be like the head of oh, Manhattan. Borough, borough, borough commander. commander. Oh, holy mackerel. This guy's like George Jefferson. He's moving on up fast, man. <laughs> Woo. Well, you did a lot of studying. Now, you know? well, these are these now appointed or are these still tests? Battalion chief, uh, up to battalion chief is tested. Everything else is appointed. Oh, years, so ago, years ago, they were tested and they tried to get it back and it never flew. Obvious For obvious reasons, it was political and stuff, but yeah, uh, battalion, thank God they got the battalion chiefs in the union because that that's an important thing. All right, so you took two steps back, back to battalion chiefs, and what, three or four steps forward, now the district chief? Back to two steps up when two I went downtown. Went I went downtown. To the, it's the downtown area. That was a, like being in Manhattan, only smaller. <laughs> so uh, you're not really responding. So what would be your equivalent to a deputy chief then? If you have battalion, the battalion chiefs run the, the job or do the deputy chiefs run uh, the job? Deputy, deputy district chief. A and deputy then we were on, the district chiefs were on eight hours, but we had seven day response duty where we'd go to citywide extra alarms at night after five. Okay. So we still went to fires. So you were still going to fires, which is good. Which is oh, yeah. to do. Yes. And you had a driver then? No, no driver. You took your car home. You oh, oh hoity-toity guy. Now. Uh, his own mm. car home. I'm writing that down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> took his own car. Yeah, I, was one of, I was one of them guys. <laughs> At what point? Yeah, I, it's coming soon because there's still more on this on this resume right here, bro. So. <laughs> <laughs> at some point, I think he's getting a driver here. I don't know where it is, but it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> so 2006, we get promoted to assistant deputy fire commissioner of operations. Correct. Right. Is that correct? Do you have a driver yet? Nope. Holy <laughs> mackerel. What the hell is going on in Chicago? Uh, that is wrong. wrong. And he did the wrong, wrong thing. thing. So what are you doing now as assistant deputy fire commissioner of operations? Uh, right above me is the deputy fire commissioner operations, the first deputy and the commissioner. So I was second in charge of operations citywide for fire. We had one, uh, Mark Levinson was my my partner. He was on, on the EMS side. 
but we were over we oversaw operations throughout the city. Uh, now, so you go to like third alarms or greater or something or any all well, hands? Two, I went to everything because I could, but you, two 11s usually. <laughs> yeah. Uh, two or three 11s. But yeah, it was it was a great, great, great time. So what else would you be doing in your daily course of, uh, of duties? Uh, you oversaw training. You oversaw, uh, you know, uh, job changes, apparatus, uh, you name it. We had our finger in it. Is there anything that you, you implemented that was like, uh, you know, a bug of yours that you, you – you know, you wanted to bring it to the Chicago Fire that now at this point you could bring in? Uh, not until I was the commissioner. We tried to do it then, but it didn't shake out too well, was to bring – we had 24 battalions. And myself and Mike Fox, the guy I was a fan with at Engine 45, his dad was a captain there. The he guy with the up, glasses? That's him, the funny-looking guy. Pete, show that picture. What you, so you guys were fans together, and then you rose the chain together. Yes, he was. Uh, we 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 were good friends. We still are. Uh, he was sure. assistant deputy fire commissioner of special operations. After nine eleven, the things that we learned, and a lot of it was from you guys. Um, we were fighting and fighting and fighting to get a special ops battalion chief, and because of the mayor and the mayor's chief of staff, who was Ray Orozco at the time, was on our job at one time. Great guy. Uh, we were able to get a 25th battalion. Its signature was 515, but that was a special ops BC. He oversaw all the squads. And we got that idea from you guys, and it's still in existence today. And what's under that umbrella now? Just the squads, or do you have, have you, have you, you know, brought more, more hazmat special is under that, or? That? Uh, squad companies, hazmat, air sea rescue. We have a helicopter unit, we have a dive, uh, dive team, a dive truck, and we have the two fast boats. So you have one, one dedicated hazmat now? We have two. One is at the airport. It can leave the airport proper. 511 is a uh, signature. That's in the center of the city, and 512 is at the airport. So the and squad's no longer doing the hazmat work. It's the hazmats. Um, they back up hazmat one? Yeah, there's third. The, the training is – the hazmat guys are more in-depth training, but right. the squad guys can put on a suit and go show the valve off. Without getting their blood pressure taken, you know right. what I mean. You have to have enough duct tape with them. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta have the duct tape. Gotta have the duct tape. Gotta have the duct tape. You got that Wikipedia or no? Oh, he brother Ray. Of him with his friend. Um, him with the kid uh, with the glasses. I'm the looking early. for it. The only person. Thought it was at the end of all the pictures. It was right. towards the end. It was a picture. Uh, it looked like a, they were standing at the rig. It looked like uh, the chief with standing next to Harry Potter. He does oh. look like Harry <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, looking, I'm looking. Hold on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there they are. Uh, that was, uh, uh, those were the two points. That was Mike Fox and myself in probably 1971. So 71. You, he became what, – what did he rise to? What was the highest level Assistant he rose Deputy to? Fire Commissioner of Special Operations. Oh, no shit. Holy he was the head of he was the head of he was he was the uh, he was the guy in charge of special ops. And you became the fire commissioner. Who'd have thought if you took this picture? <laughs> oh, <never. laughs> right. Uh, and, and I got a. I don't know if we got time. I got a quick story about us riding a truck fifteen forty five. Yeah, go. Yeah. Um. When we got out of high school, Mike worked at Paxton Patterson. It was a tool factory, and I was doing concrete. So every third shift, we'd come in at night. The cook would put us in the meals. We'd pay him. We got there. But we'd get there like at 5.30 or 6 at night, and he'd put his stuff on the engine, and I'd throw my stuff on the back of the Mac. And they, a guy gets transferred in there. And this is before we had our contract, so you couldn't you had to fill out the pinky yourself. They, they called up and had this guy was on an engine company downtown. And they didn't like him. So they, they put a transfer in for him to the busiest truck in the city. So he ends up at truck 15. Well, number one, he doesn't know how he got there. Number two is like the third day he's there, he's on a truck and he sees me come in and he sees Mike come in and we throw our stuff. I throw my stuff on a rig. And now the chief's going along with this because the guy set him up. The Italian chief's in the house. He says, uh, does he let you work your side job when, you know, you can go work your side job? I said, yeah, yeah, we come in after work, you know, for work. If it's a weekend, we come in for 24, but this guy <laughs> hook has no stuff. idea. Oh, uh, he had the hook right in there, man, like a big uh, mouth fast. 
Yeah, <laughs> let him go for a while. Then he, went, he was a master chief if he could work his side job too. Oh, how'd that go? <laughs> uh, Not too well. That was the old tugboat skipper. He wore his hat cockeyed, the chief. Oh. <laughs> nice. He was head I, of the, I got the crow, the crow uh, club, huh? That guy. He was on a crow club. <laughs> yeah. crows I like that, yeah. man. The crow club. Jeez. I got to write these things down. The crow club. What else did we learn tonight, bro? The uh, Those two guys are the same, right, Pete? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this oh, that, guy. Man. that guy and the other guy are the same guy. Same guy. Right. I got to ask the chief question. This, yeah. is, this may be too esoteric, but you let me know. So um, these are those big words. Oh, boy. So, uh, then, then he can maybe explain to me what esoteric means. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. This may be a little too <laughs> out yeah, of the It may no be a little out, 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 out in the ether, but a man with your experience, Chief, a guy with all the years that you have and all the stuff you've been through and everything you've seen, what do you think um, is the defining moment of your career? Hmm. Hmm. That is esoteric. Hmm. I'll, I'll answer that in two ways. My proudest moment is when my son was sworn in as a firefighter. That is bar none. The proudest moment in my life is when he was sworn in as a Downers Grove firefighter, firefighter paramedic. He did something that I didn't do. I wasn't a paramedic hmm. firefighter. He's on the USAR team for the state of Illinois. He's He takes after both of his grandfathers. Jack Gallopo was his grandfather. My dad was his grandfather. He's got both of them in him. Good oak. And, uh, Good oaks. That was my proudest moment. Um, as far as the job, um, we got picks, Petey. Throw them up. Uh, yeah, uh, go ahead, Chief, while I find this pick. Ask that question again. So, what, what is, what's the most, what's oh, the no. most defining the proudest, moment? Of defining your, moment of for your, your career. Of your, not proudest, but defining. Like, what would you say defined your career? In, in in the uh, in the CF day, define it is that I I was the most fortunate person that I know to have the career I did, and it wasn't all me. It was from the people I learned from. Um, but to be the fire commissioner in Chicago Fire Department, and if the wow. mayor didn't leave, I wouldn't have left. Um, I didn't see eye to eye with the mayor, the incoming guy. Um, and, and that's the truth. I'm, I'm not going to lie about it. Um, I, I would have loved to stay in, I, and I, I stay on. And uh, to be, to work with a group of people that, you know, we always, we always look at the bad. We always take the bad, and we concentrate on the negative ones and the bad ones and the piss poor, the crows. Um, we always concentrate on them. But in my eyes, everywhere I went, and that's what I was taught, concentrate on the good people. And I, th I think I lived up to that and being the commissioner and, you know, was there a lot of things that could have been done better when I was in that position? I'm sure there could, there were a lot of critics out there, but I tried to make as, as another mentor of mine who was, he's the guy that holds, was holding the kid coming out of our lady of angels fire. His name was Dick shy. He's in that group of Eddie Rickard and Jack Gallopo. He said, leave the job. And this is no slight to the females, but this is, He's an old timer. He said, leave the job a little bit better for the next guy. And that's that's what I tried to do in my little way. We all leave a little ingot somewhere. We're not, you know, and the other part of this is people come up to me and say, hey, you were the fire commissioner. Wow. And you know what? Still, even being retired, I'm humble. I don't, I, I'm fortunate to have what I had. And all I did was try to help people. And, and, and we do a lot of company officer training. And one of the things that that I profess and I can say it because I lived it is, is it the every bugle you get, it's less about you and more about your people. And it's not so they do what you want them to do. It's so when the bell rings and they go out the door, they do what they're supposed to do. It's not about pleasing the boss. It's about doing the right thing. Chief, how did, how did you balance that? I wanted to ask you this from when, when the first time I saw it, that you were the commissioner. How do you balance that with working for the city, right? I mean, I mean, we work for the city, but now you're really working for the city, right? You're the main guy and the go-between between the mayor and the fire department, right? You're kind of like outside of the loop of the fire department now. So how do you balance between money or 
you know, and trying to do what you know as a fireman at heart? I was extremely fortunate in that position. Mayor Daly was the mayor. Um, the chief of staff, his chief of staff at that time was Ray Orozco Jr., who was a friend of mine and also the fire commissioner to before me. He knew, he told me, he said, when you, when I got the job, he said, when you meet with the mayor, the only thing, excuse me, the only thing is never, if you don't know something, tell him, don't lie to him. And I never did. And when I went in and asked for stuff in the time I was there, why do you need it? Because of this boss, we need, and I, we never got shut down. There was a lot of things to fix, and I wasn't there long enough to fix it. And you never fix them all. But I was so fortunate enough to have the people above me to, to, and we got along with our police staff, the, the old time coppers, the bosses, they were good because we did a lot of functions together. So it was a fun job. It was fun. Hmm. Um, I think the biggest thing that in my time, in my watch is the fire commissioner. I had three line of duty. I, we had three line of duty desks, but they were under my watch. We had Chris Wheatley fell off a, 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 a roof ladder, a ladder going to a roof. We had Corey Ankum and Ed Stringer who were killed on December 22nd, 2010. That was a day that lives in infamy. That's when we had the 22 firefighters killed in 1910 at the stockyards fire. It's when Kelvin Anderson died. Um, this is a picture of, of me given Ed, Ed Stringer was divorced. That's his daughter. Me, that's something you don't ever want to do um, is to go talk to the family and then have to do this. Uh, the firefighter that was killed with him was a young man. He just had his year on a job. His name was Corey Ankum. Oh, they were killed in a fire on uh, December 22nd, 2010. Um, and it was a vacant building and it, it was known for people living in there. And that's why they were in there overhauling, doing a search when the truss roof came down. Um, and the fire was out at that time. It was just hot spots. But a long story short, um, Mike Alton was a was the writ chief. And uh, he was a squad squad member officer at one time, and he went in, got a hearse tool, and the guy that was laying right next to to Ed Stringer, he was able to lift with the hearse with the jaws, able to lift and get this guy out. He lived and went off the job, but Eddie was right next to him, and he was he didn't he wasn't so lucky. The other guy, Corey Ankin, we couldn't find him. This is a shift change this fire, and uh, Corey Ankin was a young guy. He was on Tower Thirty Four. Um, Two weeks before this, his wife was the mayor's, one of the mayor's secretaries, this young guy, Corey. He crossed over from police. And I hope I'm not confusing you with this story, but no, no. Um, two weeks before they were killed, the mayor had a Christmas party, and all the, the heads of the departments went to the party, and he invited his staff. So myself and my wife show up at the party, and we're in the lobby, and who shows up but Corey Ankum and his wife. Mika, who is the mayor's, one of the mayor's secretaries. So, so this guy has got a smile. I know him. I saw him at a couple of fires before that because I know his Lieutenant Larry Anneman. Anyway, he had a smile from here to here. And uh said, how's it going over there, Cor? Man, I love it. I love it. And it, it, was, no. it was a busy company. So when we're leaving, we didn't sit at the same table with them. We sat with other, you know, department heads and whatever. We're leaving. They're walking out. We get on the elevator at the same time together. My wife and his wife, me and Corey. And I said, man, just be careful out there. Be safe. He says, chief, I love it. I love it. I can't wait to go to work. So he's the guy we're oh, missing. Yeah. And uh, his stepbrother, we dug him out. I was there. We had to cut him, cut parts out around the chainsaw. Not him, but part of the building to get him out. And the guys, as soon as we opened up the roof section where we could start working on him we we kind of knew he was gone but the guys were doing cpr on him and i look up and his stepbrother had just gotten off duty or was just he was off duty he was on another shift but he's standing over us watching and uh you know i think about the families as i do with you guys you know if you, it's not to say if you, if, if you if you lived it it's different it is but i think about the kids and the wives and the spouses um and the family members, the mothers, the fathers, it's what you, it humbles you. It humbles you to the core. And every day you go to work, try to be better. And I think that's one thing that I learned is I self critique myself as a firefighter, every, every rank I had, mm -hmm. am I letting people down? Am I doing the right thing? 
that's what kept me grounded, I think. Hmm. And you said this in the pre-show, it, it stays with you your whole life, right? You, it's something that you can never, you, you, you know, those, those feelings. It just gets that, a little, it just gets, it's not as sharp <coughs> as obviously, you know, when those things are happening initially, but it, it just dulls it a little bit, but it's always there. Always, you know, but it's how you process it. Does it make you bitter or does it make you humble? In my in my case, and because I was fortunate enough to follow in my father's footsteps, you know, I, I, I was given a lot of breaks in life and I tried to hold true to whatever I was given to make people proud of me. But mo most importantly, the people I tried to make proud of me are the ones that are not here anymore. No doubt about that. <laughs> yeah. um, no Chief, doubt about that. Chief, I got to ask a question because it keeps coming up in the chat. They're rabid. They're rabid dogs for this. Rab I got to know. They're Jagos. Um, <laughs> hey. Oh. They're not Jagos. Uh, they're good guys. And they're saying, Pete, Bobby made it, uh, multiple grabs at a historic gas leak explosion. Um, you know, so I, I was wondering if, if you could tell us that. And is that the photo that we have of you with the grab? No, that is... Uh that photo you have is on Sheridan Road, and that battalion chief um, is in many situations with the old-time battalion chief. I never, I never asked to be written up for anything. I was written up by my chief officers, but this one I didn't get written up for, and I didn't ask about it. That's just what we do. That's what firemen do. Um, as far as my, my awards, um, I won the city's highest award twice, and, and am I proud of it? Yes. But you know what? Any good firefighter or paramedic that I ever worked with put in the same position would have done the same thing. So do I look at myself as being special? Hell no. Mm -hmm. I was in the right place at the right time. Um, and that's all I can say. I'm not, am I proud? Yeah. But I know if, if any of those guys that were in those pictures and, and a lot of my friends and the guys I worked with and gals too, if they were put in that position, they would have done the exact same I thing I did. The only difference between me and them is that I was recognized for it. That's all. Hmm. We're all cut out of the same cloth. And I'm looking at you guys because I know you're cut out of that cloth too. Not so. me, sir. I run from fire. <laughs> <laughs> <We're not> even... <laughs> did, Chief, when, uh, when you first got on the job, did you ever envision, even for a second, that you might rise to the level of fire commissioner? I mean, do you look that, back... I didn't think I'd be a lieutenant. <laughs> <laughs> and, right. and, and you know what? Every pro This may sound weird, but every promotion that, that I took up until battalion chief, I had to call call my friends and say, hey, sh you know, being on a squad, being on SS1, I never want to leave this company. Work yeah. with the best guys. You're going citywide fires. If there's crazy shit going on, you're going, what could be better in life? But you know what? I got talked into it and I took it. Because you know what? SS1 went out of service. Things change on the job. So if you think, you know, you're in a good spot, you can go somewhere else and make another spot better. You know, and that that's, you know, I, I, was, I was looking for, as a captain, I was looking for squad five. And I know there were some heavy ringers ahead of me that were going to get it, but I was kind of hanging out for it. And when I was, the promotion came from battalion chief, I'm, uh, should I take it? Should I take it? And I got talked into taking it. And I'm blessed. I did it. I bet the service was better for having you, sir. I really do. Oh, no doubt about it. I mean, uh, it's like um, it's like Chief Richardson here now. You're a firefighter's firefighter, you know? So, uh, yeah, it, you're the right man for the job, I'm sure. I'm glad they talked you into it. Yeah, Thank you. The, best, the, the greatest ones are always humble, like this gentleman right here. It's amazing. Humble bumble. Humble bumble. And now, do you do you t when you see Liam? Do you tell him the same thing? Don't take battalion chief state rest. He's had that conversation over a lot of sarsaparillas. Oh, I'm sure he has. A, sure a couple has. sarsaparillas, Sioux City sarsaparillas. I'm I get sure it. Want to know something? No, that guy can outlast me. Yeah, yeah. He's got, he's got, he's got a, some practice. Like, that. Yeah, he's got some practice. Like, right? With being in what the a, what a, what a, yeah, I mean, all your guys did that I've encountered and, and, and were able to work with. And I throw this back to you, number one, thanking me for being, a, thank you for having me on the show, but the networking, that's another thing I'd like to throw out there for the group, the young guys that are listening and gals, is the networking. I always thought New York sucks, Boston sucks, Milwaukee sucks, Chicago's the best, right? Until you get outside of your box and you meet other people, seriously, the only difference between us is our patch. 
Yeah. That's the only difference. We're all we're all in, the, in this for the same reason. And we love it. And we should we should all network. And, and yeah. I learned that as a lieutenant when, when I started going around taking classes. Man, there are I don't care if you're from a small department and don't go to a lot of fires. If you're into this job, I'm going to learn something from you and you're going to learn something from me. And that's what it's all about. Yeah, we get that a lot now, especially going to the shows, meeting guys from, you know, now all around the country. But definitely when we were taking that, it, it, it kind of was an eye opener for us with the hazmat classes. Right. When you had to go to bomb or rad or any of those things, you would run into a lot of guys and exactly what you said. You know, yep. everybody's the same and everybody has their own pride for their own place. Right. So hey, well, wherever you are, that's the best place, you know. Yeah. Or Mike but we're all the same. All the we're all the same here and in here. Both wherever places. you are, the that's same. the best place yeah. on earth to be working. There's no doubt about it. What a Bobby Galeon safe. Heart and balls. balls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> teach right. you the rest. <laughs> we had a guy. We had a guy in our job, Pat Lynch. He's retired lieutenant from Squad Two. I, he was my partner in concrete. He was my friend for a long time. He still is. But his saying was, "Balls, water, and common sense." <laughs> well, I like that. Let me write that down, Ruffy. Hold on a minute. Yeah, yeah, no, sure. yeah, yeah, I know you I know you wanted to mention uh the guy that we met at the show, Jim Regan, right? He's the one you talk about networking, He's right? In the chat. I mean, uh you know what? Uh Jim Regan is probably one of my closest friends and probably one of the greatest guys I ever met. Um, if it wasn't for Jim, there wouldn't be the friendships amongst many Chicago firefighters and New York firefighters and Boston firefighters. And it's all because of Jim. And if you sit down and ask Jim, I, I take half of our job and half of your job. And he, to put those people together, he knows more about Chicago, Boston, and New York than all those guys put together. Hands down, bar none. Good man, tough man. Um, I love him to death. And if it wasn't for him, a lot of these networks. So, so what I'm saying is that Jim Regan, has saved a lot of lives because of his friendships and him bringing people together. So shout out to Jim. Salute. I like that. Shout, shout out to Jim. Yeah. And we met him. He's crazy. He's not, and he's not a jag off. Hey! Oh. Wow, man. What a, what a, what a freaking night. What a night. Oh, yes. uh, oh where are we at, uh, Mr. We, well, uh, we, we already went past fire commissioner, and then he retired in 2012, only to get hired in 2012 as deputy <laughs> chief of the Carroll Stream oh, Fire Department. God. Correct? The Carroll Stream Fire Department, Fire District, I'm sorry. Right. And then uh, promoted to the chief CSFD. And then in January 22, that uh, 2020, that's it. You had enough. No moss. You done? Now he went fishing. He went fishing. Sort of. Oh, oh, oh boy. He didn't go fishing yet. He didn't go Let's fishing. Oh, track, boy. Just one one thing about Carroll Stream. I was asked to come out there by my friend then, Rick Colomay, who was the chief. Uh, he retired. I got the chief's job, which I didn't want. But I, I got to tell you this because it, it's a smaller department. It's three stations, 60 people. Um, it's like when I worked there, I couldn't believe what I stepped into. It's like being in three of the best firehouses in Chicago that I worked in. These people are gung-ho, balls out, the females too, um, <laughs> just into the job. Touché. All, the, all the parts out. Yeah. <laughs> That's just a saying. I'm sorry, ladies. Um, but they, they're they so into the job. It was a pleasure to go to work there. I live in a town. I still live in that town. Mm. Um, and the guy that took my spot, he was he was ready for it. And the guy that was under him, that's the deputy now, was the union president as a lieutenant. They're game on. They're good people. I, I never worked in a small department with such a great group of people. So it was an honor to work there. It wasn't, you know, they didn't get me. I got them. And it was an honor. Good people. So we talked about that. The people who touch you to make you who you are, right? No matter how far you are in your career, it can happen. And, and, and Chief's, got, Chief's got to remember that they're, they're on the bottom. They're on the bottom, and they should be, because you're there to serve your, your troops. If you got assholes, you take care of them. But the majority of people are good. You're there to give them what they need to do their job. And, and that's what it's about. And that's, that's how it was for me in the city. And that's how it was for me when I came out here. And, and, you know, I keep my finger in the pie by doing training with the State Fire Academy. That keeps me, keeps me out of my wife's hair and it keeps me happy. 
But speaking, you know, of which, speaking of which, Pete, can we put up the lovely Mrs. Hoff? I, I he, just, you know, oh, it's so funny that you he mentioned just that. did all right. He did all right. This guy. I had. Wait, you look at him stepping up to that. Coops, hit him, that buddy. Coops, hit him. I think he married up a little bit. Of just. Hey. Hey. I, I, I didn't know. I, I didn't too. Her eyes are bad. Beautiful. What is <laughs> 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 That's my Polish princess. Nice. Oh, nice. oh, oh, I got, I got a Polish princess too. Awesome. She's a, she's a dog lover, and she turned me into one. And she's the best thing that ever happened to me. Good, Good for, for you. you. Good for oh, you. God bless. I, have, I, have an, I have an Asian princess. I say the same thing. <laughs> a little Asian princess. Where would we be without him? Hell Damn, yeah. Damn Skippy. Yeah. yeah, you're right, sir. Going in circles. All right. I think, I think it might be that time, though, Chief. Ooh. Ooh. Ah, you know what time it is, guys? It's time for oh, the old school of the day, day, day. Take it away, Chief. Um, to especially the younger group out there, when you came on a job, the first day you came to work, and the passion and the and the momentum you had in your heart, keep that till the day you leave. And the other thing, it's it's passion and courage. And the courage is not to go in and rescue somebody. That's part of it. But the other part of courage is do the right thing. Think outside the box. There's times that you, every, you know, young people today want everything written down. It can't be. You're out in the street to serve the public, to save their lives and protect their property. Do what you got to do to do that. And if you have good bosses and good chiefs, they'll answer for you when you step outside of the line to do something that's right. That's all Amen. I got. I like that. That's simple. I like it. I like it. And I got to say, Chief, uh, I'm a, I am a better man having met you this evening. No, it's, just, uh, it's just up there. This is in the top. Yeah, Top stuff. You, you are an extremely humble and just uh, an amazing firefighter, chief, amazing career, and uh, Chicago is better off for having had you as well. I, I and, appreciate it. And I know you know this already, but I'm sure the old man is uh, is Mucho doing a proud. salute tonight. Yeah, there's no oh, doubt. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Amen. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I have nothing left in my cup. I can't give you this. I'm done. And I'd like to thank Jimmy Regan as too, because he's the one who put us together. He's a networker. We're going to well, call the, Jim Regan the networker. The Chief fixer. Hoff's name has come up. Uh, <laughs> Chief Timothy, uh, he mentioned a few times. His name has popped up a few times. but uh, Now we got him. We lassoed him. We lassoed him. We got him. We did. Excellent. It's good. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. It was an honor. Good to meet you. No, uh, it's it's our honor, honor was ours. <laughs> oh, me. my God. Are you <laughs> kidding me? Like, <laughs> look, at, look at me. Oh. Just oh, take a look at me, sir. Yeah. I have no business sitting in this chair. What right was here. the word you used? That's the only thing you had. Oh, uh, not erroneous. What the hell did I say? I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know. Esoteric. 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 Yeah, I remember that I'd look it up after the show. <laughs> <laughs> it's like out in the ether. Esoteric. You know what yeah. I mean? That's what oh, that is. Man. Don't worry Somebody about it. Somebody say, Chief, reach out to Corey's brother, Gerald Glover. He's been looking for you. I don't know what that means. That's... that's uh, that's the gentleman I was talking about from Tower 34 who was there when his brother was dug out. Okay. He's been looking for you. Excellent. Excellent, 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 Ooh. Chief. Great show. I'm so Man. glad we had you on. What Bad a great night. show. What a great show. <clears throat> you got any shout-outs tonight, Ruffy? I do. I have two. Two quick ones. Um, Give it. I know we, we mentioned this before, but this is uh, the Fight for Firefighters Foundation uh, dot com. They have their September 13th. They have the uh, Mod Talk Fishing Tournament. Check them out online. I don't know if there's tickets available uh, still for the raffle, but uh, if you want to go fishing, again, it's fight for firefightersfoundation.com. Basically, those guys, they go out there. Anybody who needs uh, ramps or anything to any uh, changes that they need for the houses, you know, for guys that were cancer, uh, they're handling all that stuff. So uh, they do a great job. So I just wanted to mention those guys again. And then also, uh, Jeff Cool. Uh, had mentioned uh, the Bird's Eye View Project. He's running. Let me get it up here quick here so I don't misspeak. So basically, he's involved in a fundraising event, which they're raising five, $500,000. This is the um, <clears throat> guy was a Navy SEAL. This is uh, – he was that was the guy who was supposed to come – I don't remember his name. He was supposed to come on our show. Johnny Walters? Yes, with John Walters' friend, right. Yep, so yep. Uh, basically, they run this uh, 
tactical course laid out. It's over five miles. Each station on the course is set up for, with former special ops members. Uh, and uh, Jeff Cool got involved with this. But that's the website there. And and do the backslash uh, for Jeff Cool. So um, check it out. And uh, I don't know. Go run through some muck yeah. and mire, I guess. I don't know. Uh, the last station is a little uh, one-legged little guy. And... Uh... <laughs> 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 Got to get done in every time. That's John, that's John Walters, Chief. <laughs> Johnny Chief. Walters. Yeah, yeah a.k.a. Right. Pegleg. We love him. Oh, Peg yeah, Peg he got, got ran yeah. over by a cab. I mean, unbelievable, dude. And and, and the guy the guy comes on the show and these two knuckleheads go, hey, we got to get some sort I of a crash it. sound effect for him. I'm like, dude, watch his leg. Yeah. And now it's this. Every time. Yeah. <laughs> I love you, Johnny Dubs. I'm sorry, buddy. All right, listen. Uh, one last thing, Pete. Uh, any guys, I'm trying to get a, a rough head count for the guys who are coming on 9-11 to the bar afterwards. Uh, so if you plan on coming to Squad 288 for 9-11, shoot it over to Coob's podcast and give at, me gmail. a, 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 at gmail.com and give me a rough count on how many guys are coming. I don't want to be bombarded here. And the guy, uh, you know, we can't accommodate, but I think we will, we'll do all right. I think we'll be all right, Spider. And we got that one photo, Coob's, of the flag. Yeah, but Ruffy's got the information on it. I texted him like three times. He didn't answer me. No, you have right, the information right. on that flag, Ruffy? I don't. Oh, okay. You... Next show. Next show. Right. Next show. Yeah. We'll do it. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Chief Hoff, do you have any uh, shout outs for tonight, sir? I do. Uh, the Southside Fools. <clears throat> uh, they're, they're a group of young buckaroos besides McKee and Enright that, uh, and Hojack that, that train. They train on their own time. They, it's a network of people from all different departments. Guy that started it, a guy I don't know if you guys ever heard of, a guy named Jack McCaslin. Uh, he was he was instrumental. He was a chief in Oakland in Orland, in Illinois, but he's also in charge of the State Fire Academy for Technical Rescue Operations. And he put, even not being a member of Chicago, he put Chicago on the map as far as technical rescue. He got us involved. And, and uh, there's one other gentleman, his name, he's very, very ill. Um, his name is Hugh Stott. He was a battalion chief in West Chicago. Um, just a shout out to him. He was heart and soul in a job. He was good friends with Don Hayde and Sal Marchese. Um, and that's it. Say prayers for him. Thank you. Amen, Amen. Chief. Um, I got two quick ones, really so. quick. Uh, Susie from our ch from the chat. It's her and her husband's anniversary. So happy anniversary. Happy anniversary, Susie. Susie. Um, and two, Jim Graham in the chat was saying that Oceanside uh, hooked him up the other day, and they did some work right by him. Oceanside FD, uh, and they all rolled up where all of them like were rolled up wearing uh, getting salty apparel T-shirts. So God bless you, Oceanside FD, love right those next guys. To Right next door to LB. Uh, we love you guys out in Oceanside and everywhere yes. else. So thank you guys. For and support. listen, if you're coming to Squad 288, uh, probably around 8 a.m. is when the services kick off. Somewhere between 8 and 9, but 8 a.m. Uh, class A's preferably, but not uh, mandatory. Yep. And that's it. There is no show on Labor Day because Monday is Labor Day. Correct, boys? We're taking the yep. night off. Yes, sir. And yes, we sir. will be back on that Thursday, Pete, and I believe it's the husband and wife team, right? Yeah, from, uh, New right. Haven. Yep, New Haven, Night. Connecticut. Husband and wife firefighting team seem really cool. Louie got on the phone with them and and confirmed how cool they were, and I'm really glad They're they reached cool. out. And uh, yes. and we know. got some good picks. Oh, oh. Snap. I'm not saying nothing, nothing yeah. about nothing. And remember, saying. guys, you come to the firehouse at the service at the squad. It's all straight lace and. No nonsense. We go to the bar afterwards. We can do all the shenanigans we want, but yeah. we're on a no no, sh around. no shenanigans at the firehouse. Not one bit. Not mm -hmm. on 9-11, and especially not on the 20th anniversary. Nope. Don't don't come with any bullshit. Yes. I don't want to hear it. Yes, yes. And my mom is coming to 9-11, so you guys get to meet her. Uh, Ellie Coobs. <laughs> my mother's coming, yes. And we will have – guys, I'm not getting enough questions. I want to do another wives show. So the wives and my mother – you want, uh, the chief here talked about how important the angels are, the women. They don't get enough credit. I want to do another wives show, but send the questions to Coop's podcast. I'm not getting enough. All right. That's all I got. All right. Chief, it was our pleasure. It was really a great show. I knew it would be, and uh, you're really humbled by your service. Appreciate it. Thank you for your service, you guys. All right. That's all I got. 
All right, All right boys. We'll, we'll so hang in there with us, Chief. We're gonna we're gonna I'm just gonna go through the uh the okay. end of the show and then we'll talk to you after in the uh post show. So just hang with us for a moment. Guys, you know the drill. If you're watching us here on YouTube, that's great. But if you want to listen to us, get over on iTunes Podcast, Spotify, iHeartRadio, wherever audio podcasts are found. That's where we are. Um, it's great for car rides or going to the gym if you can't watch the show. And, of course, if you are watching the show on YouTube.com forward slash getting salty experience, Hit the like, subscribe, and share button, dude. Come on. It's free. It's free. Did I mention it was free? It's, it's free. free. Anyway, it's free. Head on over to Instagram if you're on there already, at Salty Dog Inc., where you will find all the coolest curated fire photos that Mr. Refrano puts up all week long, plus last-minute info for the show in the stories. Uh, also, guys, get saltyapparel.com. That's how we pay the bills here. Um, thank you to... Uh, Everyone who uh, hooked us up in the Super Chat tonight, you guys are extremely generous as always. And always, uh, we appreciate our audience. You guys are the best audience in the game. Um, and also, guys, speaking of best audiences, Facebook has a Getting Salty Fans page where you will find awesome uh, memes and jokes, mostly breaking my balls and Kevin's height. Uh, I don't understand it, you know, but uh, it's just, it's, you know, it's what it is all day long. But... Uh, no, there is some really great stuff going out there. A lot of great fire stories, man. A lot of good stuff. And uh, what a community uh, we have there. I think uh, over 16,000 in there as well. Uh, guys, if you want to email the show, get in salty experience at gmail.com. And last but not least, uh, shoot your Q&As, man. I don't think we've answered every question yet. Shoot I mean, it, shoot the J. Shoot, shoot it. it. Um, but uh, definitely shoot us those Q&As there. And for Cup of Joe and some Fuego, it's Coob's podcast at gmail.com that's right we want your lid photos your rig photos your fire photos and helmet cam videos your tattoo pics all the good stuff that you guys already know that you see on cup of joe and fuego we did our first live one the other day i gotta tell you boys i really like doing a live one i think that's a good that's a good not every time but i like doing it live we'll do it live do it do it live and the the head count for uh (laughs) for 9-11 coop yeah end it yeah, send send that over. We want to make be as organized and as respectful as possible, and that's going to help us out. And that, my friends, is all the news that is fit to print. Uh, I'm going to just throw this out to Chief Bob Hoff. What do you think about a live show from Ladder 15, the busiest company in Chicago? Just throwing it out there. I don't know. Maybe we could do that someday. Come out there to Chicago, go to Ladder 15, maybe do a little live show from there. Bring some ravioli. Well, they're not the busiest anymore. Oh. oh. Where would you recommend? Oh boy, there's a lot of good places. To ah, I put them in a pickle. Put them on the spot. What's the pickle. matter with you? Come on. Well, how about one of those? I, one of the I, because I'm partial, people are going to get pissed at me. But I say Squad Five. Oh, Ooh. all right. So we do a live Outside. show. Right? We do a live. There's, there's, there's truck. There's tower. Oh, it's not Tower Thirty Four anymore. There's Truck Twenty Six on the West Side. Tower Fourteen. There's some super companies out there. I, I, I'd be getting people mad if I picked one. Well, I have your number. Maybe we'll come on out to Chicago. Well, I hope to see you on 9-11 sometime. All right. Hopefully we'll hook up. I hope, my, right. I hope my son's back from the deployment down in the- – Old man, old man Malay will be at the firehouse on 9-11, too. He'll get to beat that old uh, meet that old fossil. Beat so, that uh, old fossil? You're going to beat the old fossil, Frank? You can, you can beat up Frank if you want. <laughs> Hank's going to be there hanging out and being cool, but you could beat up Frank, whoever he yeah, is. Him, too. Yeah. All right. That's all I got. Uh, stay low and go. All right, everybody. We'll see you at the big one. Cheers, brothers.